Planet set. Speed. And action. I know it was you, Fredo. You broke my heart. You know how to whistle. You just put your lips together and... Hello. Welcome to the Foot and Friends on Film Podcast, discussing everything about cinema. Now here's your host, Nick Ayler. Welcome to the official podcast of Foot and Friends on Film.com, where we discuss everything about cinema. I'm your host, Nick Mailer. On today's episode, I'll be joined by John H. Foote, as well as Alan Hurst, another one of our staff writers at FootandFriendsOnFilm.com. The three of us are going to discuss the 1970s, which some argue is the greatest decade in all of cinema. Time to take your seats and grab your popcorn. It's time for your feature presentation. As mentioned, we are the official podcast of Foot and Friends on Film.com, where our motto is any film you have not seen is a new experience. As per usual, today I'm joined by our founder and CEO. Without further ado, please welcome John H. Foot. And as I mentioned in the intro today, for the first time ever, staff writer Alan Hurst is joining us. Please welcome Alan Hurst. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to have Alan join us uh, for the first time. Hopefully, uh, many more to come. Hey. Alan, I'd like to start off by asking you about how your uh, love of film uh, started. And I understand that uh, some of the films of the late 60s were uh, very important in that uh, journey and evolution for you. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely. I think, well, I got tweaked into film in like mid 60s with my first movie was Mary Poppins combined with The Sound of Music. So they're kind of entwined for me. Um, but as a young teen watching movies on a black and white television. It was Bonnie and Clyde, uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and uh, They Shoot Horses Don't Think that really got me got me going and into film. John, how uh, involved were you uh, with getting Alan involved in uh, cinema? I don't know that I can, I can say I was involved. We were, I mean, we're first cousins. We, we knew and saw each other quite a lot, but we would talk about movies at family gatherings and, uh, you know, Christmases, things like that. But I, I think Alan kind of came in his, his own way for film. And I think we, we went in, you correct me if I'm wrong, Alan, I think we went in different directions for the types yeah. of films that we, that we admired. I think but, so. But I think for both of us, I think our parents were key and because they both had an interest, therefore I had an interest. Yes. Um, um, and I think that continued. Um, I know your your tastes and mine, they kind of verge out and then they come back in over, over certain things. Very um, true, very true. But um, I have to admit, like, I, for me, it was like, in my early teens, just getting in to see things that I probably shouldn't have been getting in to see um, and talking my parents into letting me watch something like Is Afraid of Virginia Woolf on television, uncut, um, with some of the language that was pretty shocking for 1973 or 74, whenever it was on television. Um, but it was those films that really got me. I still love other types of films, but it's those ones that really pushed the boundaries in the late 60s and early 70s that just sucked me right in. And I was hooked on anything realistic, anything that, that reflected life in society at the time. And growing up in the 70s, as, as you did, Alan, I mean, the cinema of the 70s mirrored society in a way that it had just never, ever been done on the screen before. And those, those were the films that drew me in, that attracted me. And, and I don't think I knew that at the time. I just know that I was, I wanted to see Cabaret because that was the thing to see. I wanted to see Chinatown because it was the thing to see. And I wanted yeah. to come and see Jaws yeah. Um, yeah. and all the president's men. Um, I don't, I won't even begin to say I understood everything I was seeing when I was 14, 15 and 16, but I keep going back. If I'm going to sit down and put a movie on, I have a fascination for the 40. But if I'm going to put something on that takes me back to when I was a kid, those are the movies I go back to. I tend to, 
I tend to like deep films, films that are about something. And for me, the movies of the 1970s almost consistently were about something. Mm -hmm. And that excites me. I mean, it was suddenly it was okay to explore divorce and drug addiction and Vietnam and Watergate. I mean, two years after Nixon resigned, they made all the president's men. That, that was extraordinary. And it was, it was just a great time to be growing up watching movies. I remember in 1976, seeing Cabaret on a re-release at the Marks, bouncing over to the Regent to see Bound for Glory, heading over to the Odeon to see Marathon Man, and then up to the Highland to see The Shootist or, or Logan's Run or something. You could, you could spend a whole day at the movies yeah. and in 76 see consistently great films. Yep. I mean, I also, I also went for the schlock too. I mean, I was babysitting my sisters and cousins, so we would go see Rooster Cogburn, <laughs> then, we would see then we would go see Harry and Walter go to New York. Um, like, no matter what, any that was playing, I would go to. Deep Dark uh, Secret, I've, I've seen all those. Yeah. Seen all those. And like you, I went to everything. It didn't matter what it was, I had to see it. The yeah. 19th, sorry, go ahead. No, it's just, I said, like, I, my forte is probably 40s and 50s stuff and into the 60s, but the 70s, it's, it's the sweet spot. Um, for me because I don't think and I don't think we appreciated it at the time it's only in retrospect when you look back and see okay they were really doing something special and the same is too it's true with television at that era as well like we were it, both were a golden age um but you didn't realize it till about 10 or 15 later and you look back it's like holy crap like the between 66 and 79 there was a lot of amazing stuff there was there was 1970s have been called by many uh, to be the greatest decade in the history of cinema or the most influential. John, you think that's fair? I do. I do. And for various reasons, I think the 70s are also called the director's era. And it was a time when the, the film director gained absolute power over their work. And there were a lot of young guys emerging from film school, and they were the first generation of director emerging from film school. They had grown up with neorealistic Italian cinema. They'd grown up with the French New Wave. And now there is this shift in American films brought on by Bonnie and Clyde, The Graduate 2001, Midnight Cowboy, and They Shoot Horses, don't they? And they could make films that they wanted to make and pay homage to the films of the past. And I mean, such, such a breadth of young directors coming up at the time, Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, Woody Allen, Francis Coppola, Brian De Palma, Scorsese. Incredible, absolutely incredible. You wanna talk a little bit about the infamous beach house that you and I have been discussing? Yeah, in 69, 70, there was a beach house rented by Margot Kidder and Jennifer Salt. And on the weekend, you could walk into that beach house and likely see Francis Ford Coppola sitting in a corner holding court George Lucas right by his side, taking in every word. Across the room might be Brian De Palma romancing Margot Kidder. Martin Scorsese would arrive in a three-piece three white suit with flowers for the ladies. And in a corner, shy and terrified with Steven Spielberg. They actually all got together before they were famous and would talk about their upcoming projects, what they wanted to make, their hopes and their dreams. And Coppola hit big first. And uh, they continued going to this beach house for Chile. We can't talk about uh, the start of the 1970s in cinema without mentioning Woodstock. Do you want to take this one, Alan? Um, no, <laughs> you go. Okay. Woodstock is, I mean, Woodstock was a, a cultural revolution highlight in 1969, a rock concert that was supposed to attract 10,000 to 20,000 people and ended up having half a million people there. And this small farm in, in upstate New York became the site of one of the greatest cultural events in the, in the history of the United States. And they documented it and created a three hour documentary that was actually edited by Thelma Shoemaker and Martin Scorsese. And it's, it's like a time capsule. Um, the performance of Jimi Hendrix during the Star Spangled Banner on the electric guitar, uh, the Mamas and the Papas, Janis Joplin, all of them, just, just an electrifying documentary that crossed into the mainstream. Woodstock was a mainstream hit. The soundtrack album went triple platinum and it won the Academy Award, richly, richly deserved for best documentary. It's one of the great documentaries of all time and broke ground for rock, not only rock and roll on film, but documentaries in the 70s. 
I remember uh, in my young teens when I started playing guitar, one of the first uh, music documentaries that I got a hold of was Woodstock and the image of uh, Jimi Hendrix doing the Star Spangled Banner um, it's tattooed in my brain and how he just managed to make the guitar sound like bombs dropping. It was uh, something otherworldly. And uh, you're right, as a documentary, it's unreal. It's unparalleled. And it is. And with, with Hendrix, you're absolutely right. It was almost as if the guitar was another appendage. It was so much a part of his body, so much a part of his soul. And film captured that in a way that perhaps a live performance couldn't. The cinema did. You mentioned Martin Scorsese and Thelma Shoemaker working on Woodstock and the list of big name directors who made their way in the 1970s. Coppola, arguably the most influential of the decade. Do you want to discuss his evolution a little bit, John? Yeah, but only if Alan's going to jump in with me. Yeah, <laughs> good to chat about Coppola. Yeah, a couple. Yeah, definitely. Woodstock, I saw years ago, so I wasn't going to go there. So. Okay, no, no worries, no worries. Francis Ford Coppola had won an Academy Award for writing Patton in 1970, and it led directly to him being offered The Godfather. He was an Italian American, and they thought they needed such a filmmaker to capture the flavor of the book. He co-wrote the screenplay with Mario Puzo and changed the fabric of the book a little bit in that it became a study about the, the perversion of the American dream in that here's a family of immigrants who've achieved great power, great wealth, and their business happens to be crime. And I love that it's a, it's a great Shakespearean tragedy, this father and his three sons, and yeah, their business is murder. And they're a family just like any other. They love just like any other. They play like any other, but they're dangerous people. And I thought Coppola captured that brilliantly in every way. What I find fascinating is that he went, Finian's Rainbow in the late 60s, which he directed. Yes. Uh, I think that's one of the, I, I struggle with that musical. I think it's a great score, but I struggle with that musical and that movie. And the, going from that to The Godfather four years later, it's, it's extraordinary, extraordinary. I mean, the New York Times called this the, the greatest American movie since Citizen Kane. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're not wrong. They're not wrong. It was a masterfully directed film. And the performances, I mean, Brando was, was career dead. He was over. And yet they allowed him back to make this movie. He's only on screen, I think, 32 minutes. Mm -hmm. And he dominates the movie. He haunts every scene he's not in. Al Pacino. I mean, my God, what a, what a staggering performance. And he's, he's nominated for an Oscar for supporting, but he's the godfather they're talking about. He emerges the godfather. And I, I'm not sure there's ever been a greater ensemble cast than the godfather. Maybe, maybe the godfather part two. Yeah, for me though, for the godfather, it's fascinating because I don't think it would happen now is that that came out and it was like the, the land shifted. It was a huge popular hit as well as a critical hit. And you don't get yeah. those two in sync the same way you do then. You don't get that anymore. No, you don't. And that's one of the things that I, I love about the 70s is that great films were also the popular films. I mean, Cuckoo's yeah. Nest was right behind Jaws for Top Grocer of the Year. And Chinatown was right up there in 74. You're right, you don't get that anymore. And, and it's a it's great studios. Film. It's the studios. The studios aren't putting the money behind that kind of product in the same way. So. No, no, they're not. They're not. You, you're right. The Godfather would not be made today. And if it was, it would be made on HBO. Yes. Yeah. You guys both had the luxury of being alive during the decade we're talking about. Um, but yeah. I'm very old. <laughs> what, how, how did the experience of, of seeing movies, um, how did it, change in the most drastic ways during that decade you talk about the um the new wave of directors and the types of movies that were being made can you recall what it was like what the social zeitgeist was like hmm. go ahead al well it's it's kind of hard because i mean in the 70s i was in started in 1970 i was 10 and i finished the decade at 19. so like as a teen you're not exactly aware of what's going on around you politically or socially in a way that you would be in your 20s um 
but what I do recall is there was a lot of the politics at that time, even though we were in Canada, we were totally exposed to what was happening in the United States. We you were reading about the war, even though it wasn't happening here, it was happening somewhere else. There was this whole sense of, I'm not going to say discontent, um, but just disenchantment with everything. Nothing seemed to be working right. Um, and I think what the movies were doing for me at that time was allowing you to have probably not the most popular point of view. Um, and that you were being exposed to ideas that you weren't going to get growing up near Oshawa, just having a regular conversation with people, um, like walking into all the president's men or the parallax view. Um, you were getting ideas, you were seeing ideas that I think the cinema reflected what was actually going on, even if you weren't totally aware of it yourself at the time. And you mentioned all the president's men and I, I remember Watergate. We they used to wheel the televisions in for us to watch the Watergate hearings at school, and nobody knew what the hell was going on. But two years later, this book comes out, and I read the book, and it, and it was okay. But then Alan J. Pakula makes this movie that starts at the very beginning of with the break-in, the reporters being assigned to it, and a step-by-step -step breakdown of what Watergate was. So here's a film that shows us what Watergate was and the significance and how it reached right into the White House. And the fact that those reporters, Woodward and Bernstein, their lives were in danger while they were reporting that. And I love that, that cinema could do that, that it could show us, you know, go beyond all the political mumbo jumbo and cut right to the chase and the heart of the matter and show us from A to B what had happened. Well, and, and I, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go I ahead. Like yeah, what I liked was like we all knew the outcome, but you're still sitting there on the you know, just with Retter and Hoffman as they're piecing it all together. It's like like you know they're gonna do it. Yes. But you're still on the edge of your seat. I think we were just watch re watching the post a few weeks ago. And I love the way the post ends just with the break in the watergate. And it's like oh, there's the perfect double bill. Start with the post perfect. and watergate. Because perfect. it just leads right into the other. And each was, you know, each was at a time long before social media, cell phones, Facebook, the internet. So reporting was, was a hard job. There's that great shot in All the President's Men where they're going through the, the, the library cards in the Library of Congress, the, the index cards, and the camera goes up and up and up and up. And eventually you see these two puny little men at war with this massive political machine. And they break it. They bring it down. Mm -hmm. It's just, just a beautifully directed film. And it, 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 well, it also helped glamorize that whole profession as well. Um, yeah. Like it suddenly made it not just legitimate, but exciting. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's even an episode of the Mary Tyler Moore show called Mary Richards Goes to Jail. It was in 75, just, and it's the only time that show ever even overtly went political. Uh, but she goes to jail because she won't reveal a news source. Yes totally pulling in from the Watergate thing. It was a very funny episode, but I mean, even they got political based on what was happening in Washington. And I think that, Nick, more than anything else, what, what was great about film at the time is that we were dealing with real subjects, real life happenings on screen. There were still the escapist films, like the Poseidon Adventure Airport Love Story, and they, they were terrific entertainments. But we were seeing films like The Godfather, Deliverance, the Exorcist, Chinatown, The Conversation, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, movies that were absolutely realistic, you know, almost European in their sensibility. And audiences were flocking to see them. There were lineups around the block for these films. And it was just an exciting time to, to be going to the movies because there were so few bad films, it seemed. I mean, sure, there were stinkers. There really were. And most of these great directors made a stinker. But it, it, few and far between, not like today. You know, most of the movies made today are not very good. But in the 70s, you're hard pressed to see, to see two or three bad films in a row. The other thing about the 70s films is suddenly you had people who looked a little different in them. Yes. Um, you, great, I mean, point. great point. Like, you, I lo like, I love Barbara Streisand. I love Liza Minnelli. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the others. Jill Clayburgh. Like, really great women, great performers, great actresses, but they weren't conventionally pretty. Um, like they weren't Natalie Wood, they weren't Elizabeth Taylor. Um, and the same on the male side, Dustin Hoffman, Elliot Gould, um, Richard Dreyfuss, like those are not conventionally handsome guys. You still had your Redfords and your 
uh, Burt Reynolds, but you had people who looked like you would you'd see them on the street. Yes. Um, and they were playing real characters. Um, and that, that was a little different. I mean, I'm trying to think back. You go to the 40s, you still got Edward G. Robinson and things like that, but that wasn't the norm. And in the 70s, suddenly the unconventional looking people were the norm. They were. I remember reading where Paramount didn't want to cast Al Pacino in The Godfather because he looked like a, an Italian midget. Yeah. And a horrible, horrible thing to say, yet he became one of the one of the great actors of the 70s, arguably one of the great actors of all time. So there was a, a almost a seismic shift in everything about film in the 70s. There was a second coming of method acting that was really exciting. And Jane Fonda didn't, didn't just kick down the door for women. She kicked it down and stomped on it with her performance in They Shoot Horses, Don't They, which she followed with Clute. She shattered every image about women ever thought. And suddenly it was okay for women to be every bit as realistic as men. And that was hugely exciting to see. The one, well, you mentioned Jane Fonda. The one thing I find frustrating when I look back at the 70s is after Clute, I mean, she did a few things, but there was nothing of value till Julia. Yeah. And that's yeah. six years later. It's like, could she have done The Exorcist? Should, could she have done Chinatown? Could she have done um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? Like, there were, I, I just wish we had seen more of her in those five years. She certainly got offered them all and, and turned them down. A lot of it, I think she was working with her husband in his political yeah. career. And that's too bad because you're you're right. It robbed us of one of the greats, yeah. you know, one of the great actresses of all time. Let's back it up a bit and uh, try and move through the decade chronologically. John, you want to talk about 1970 and uh, the big films of that year? Sure. 20th Century Fox had two war films that were were going toe to toe with each other, and they couldn't have been more different. On one hand, they had Franklin J. Schaffner's Patton which was the biography of General George S. Patton. He was known as Old Blood and Guts. And they've been trying to make this movie for about 15 years. And at various times, different actors were going to play him. Kirk Douglas, Burt Lancaster, Rod Steiger, John Wayne, Robert Mitchum. And finally, George C. Scott was cast as, uh, as the general. And Francis Ford Coppola rewrote the script. Their other film that year was MASH, which was directed by Robert Altman, who's kind of a renegade independent director. And he wanted to set the film in Vietnam and they, they wouldn't let him. They said, absolutely not. It's gotta be set in Korea. All references in the script were, were changed to Korea. But if you watch the movie, they all have long hair. They wear peace signs. One of them has a, a shirt on that says, King Kong died for your sins, which was a very popular shirt during Vietnam. He made his Vietnam film. MASH is absolutely about Vietnam in every way. And these two films were competing for best picture of the year. Um, awards and at the box office. Both were very successful. And it's interesting that one was was a radical film against war and the other was about a man who was defined by war, a military genius. Anything to add, Alan? No, I agree. I, I My taste back in 1970 probably go a little more mainstream. Um, the, the movie that got me going that year was Airport, as much as I hate to say it. Um, <laughs> the, one of the, it was a big budget. Um, it was exciting. You were the, the tension was there. And one of the great music scores, I love the score for that movie. Um, and when I think of 1970, I think of that film, and I think of Love Story. Um, as, and as bad a movie as that is, it's, you can still watch it and still be moved by it. Um, Patton, I like. MASH is one of my favorites. Um, but I think my ultimate favorite that year probably would be Five Easy Pieces because that just seemed to break down so many different things. Um, and Nicholson suddenly became the guy with that movie. He absolutely did. And he, he defined the American male of that time, restless, uh, lonely, not knowing what they wanted out of life, uh, drifting, just drifting in, in a society that was so unsure of itself. And he hooked up with Bob Raffleson after Easy Rider and made this extraordinary film that holds up, really does hold up even today. And that extraordinary scene at the end where he leaves Karen Black in the middle of nowhere, hops in a truck, leaves his wallet and goes, just goes. Yep. And that, that was the, the, the beginning of Jack Nicholson. Do you guys recall yeah. the Oscars of that, for that year? No. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Go ahead, Alan. 
<laughs> no, my the first time I watched the Oscars was the 1972 <laughs> ceremony, so it would have been like what what March or April 1973. Okay. Um, yeah, that that's that's my first one. I've missed haven't missed any since, but that was my first one. Yeah. 1970, uh, Patton was the big winner, won seven Academy Awards. George C. Scott famously refused his. And he'd refused previous nominations for The Hustler and Anatomy of a Murder. He just didn't believe in competition among actors. So he declined it. Glenda Jackson won Best Actress. Uh, there was a whole lot of hope that a, a, an Indian actor, Chief Dan George, would win Best Supporting Actor for Little Big Man. But, uh, but he didn't. It just didn't work out. Glenda Jackson, that's another movie from that year that it's held a fascination for me, Women in Love. And it's one of the few Ken Russell movies that I can actually sit through, um, where I don't think he's going a little crazy. He's I think a it's a bizarre guy, man. Yeah, I, I just think that's a really good adaptation of the D.H. Lawrence novel. Um, and the other reason I love it is because of Glenda Jackson. Like, she, again, talk, going back to that theme of not conventional movie star, but she was actually pretty big for, the was. Most, for most of that decade. And in that movie specifically, she got a ton of praise for it. And you're never really sure. Like she either is, she actually kind of terrifies me when I watch her because you're, you're never sure how she's going to react. Um, there's just this angular um, anger, anger about her. Um, you, you're just never sure there. So yeah, that was, that's an, I can still sit and watch that movie. Um, also one of the first movies to really feature full frontal male nudity. That yeah. shocked the hell out of everybody at that point. And now it looks pretty tame, but it wasn't then. No, it wasn't. I remember that. People were uh, were upset by it. There was yeah. another Ken Russell film released that year called The Devils. Which oh, that's very right. con Oh, incredibly controversial at the time. Yeah. How did things evolve in 71? Go ahead, Alan. Well, I think 71 there's a mixture of the old and new happening in 71. You've got the conventional stuff and I'm not saying they're bad movies. You've got things like um, Fiddler on the Roof. Uh, um, I'm going to go Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, which is a, I think a really, really strong Disney film, but they're mixing up with things bumping up against a clockwork orange in the last picture show um, and the French connection. Um, so it's really the mix of the old versus new. Um, I think it's a really interesting year. One of my favorites that year, it didn't get nominated for Best Picture, but Carnal Knowledge. That one kind of really shocked the hell out of me at the time because I don't think the idea of male sexuality was presented that honestly or negatively in a film up until then. And so I find it a fascinating movie to watch. I think Nicholson's great. I think Anne Margaret is amazing in that movie. I agree. I, I think it's one of the first portrayals of a full pull out misogynist we've ever seen. Yeah. And Mike Nichols, the director, was fearless, absolutely fearless in making that film because he knew what the reaction was going to be. Stanley Kubrick cut loose in 1971 with a film that was actually banned in England, rated X in the United States. Gregory Peck was then the Academy president. And he said if it was nominated for Best Picture and Director, he would resign. It was. And I think A Clockwork Orange is a film for the ages. It's one of the few films set in a futuristic society that today still looks like it could come. It and really it, does. It's, it has still an terrifying. Age. it's still terrifying today, too. It is. It it's is. Really Malcolm McDowell is extraordinary in this film. It's, and uh, I think it's the best film of Kubrick's career. I mean, I, I get why 2001 and Dr. Strangelove were beloved. I love Barry Lyndon. I think it's exquisite. But I think this is, is Kubrick's masterpiece and was by far the year's best film. Oh, yeah. So I would go with, for me, the best film of the year was The Last Picture Show. Which is a beautiful um, movie. Can't I, be yeah. The, the, the atmosphere, the look, the cast, what, what Donovich did. I mean, he didn't do a lot else afterwards. Um, but there's something about that movie that just really captures something. And I think it's terrific. I think he captured small town America and the secrets and the lies that happen in that small town to perfection in a way that had never been done before. And the yeah. cinematography, the, the beautiful performances by everybody, everybody is spectacular. Even Sybil Shepherd, who really couldn't act all that well, but she does okay in this. Well, she's playing, she's playing herself. She's playing a spoiler. Yeah, she, she is, a variation of herself, true. For me, like I, as I love Cloris Leachman, and, but, I find it so hard to reconcile the Cloris Leachman of later years where she's the crazy old lady 
with this really heartbreaking character that she plays in that movie. She's really, really good. And she won the Academy Award, deservedly so. Yeah. Anything else on 71 before we move on? Was it for me, 71, I mentioned Bed Knobs and Broomsticks earlier, and I, I, some people might cringe at that one. But for me, that really showed me what you could do on film with special effects. I'd never really paid attention before. I was fascinated with Mary Poppins and all that stuff. But there's a scene in Bed Knobs and Broomsticks towards the end where she's able to animate all the armor in this museum against the German army. And I remember as a kid sitting there watching that, I was like, how the hell did they do that? Yeah. And, Suddenly, it's like, okay, the magic of movies. It suddenly came, became really real watching that. And that is the year I started paying attention to the Oscars because I remember reading a Life magazine article where that was mentioned that it won Best Visual Effects or something. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Yes. Yes. So 1972, which one of you wants to start? <laughs> Alan, you kick it off with Cabaret. Okay, 72, that's kind of the year I... I have a couple of transition years. I think 64 is one for me, 67, 68. But 72, it's the first time I was ever able to get to movies where I didn't have to take my sisters or just go see something that was Disney. Uh, getting into to see The Poseidon Adventure. Um, so that was a big one for me. And then kicking and screaming till I finally got to go see Cabaret. Uh, for me, Cabaret is probably the best stage to screen adaptation ever. And even though they play around with the structure of that show from what it was on stage to what it became on film, I think it's brilliant. I think the idea of making a musical about Nazi Germany, is like, okay, you gotta scratch your head over that one. But by the way they've done that with having the music, commenting on the growth of Nazism, what's happening in that country and in that city at that time, is terrific. And I think Fosse, Bob Fosse, the director, he atoned with that movie for what had happened with Sweet Charity, even though there are parts of Sweet Charity I think are pretty terrific. Um, he showed he really knew how to handle the camera. Um, they cast that movie perfectly. I know the character of Sally Bowles is not supposed to be as talented as Liza Minnelli is, but because Liza makes that character so desperate, it works. Um, again, you see her in a stage production and that character cannot sing. Um, she, it doesn't make sense on paper that she can, but with Liza, it did. I just think it's, yeah, it's probably one of my top three or four favorite musicals. I think it's, I think it's the best American musical ever made. Um, I love that Bob Fosse gave it this, this darkness, this insidious undertone, that something terrible was happening in Berlin and something terrible was coming. And that, that stunning scene in the beer garden where this beautiful blonde boy stands up and starts to sing an anthem for Germany, Tomorrow Belongs to Me. And the camera pans down and he's a Hitler youth. He's got the swastika on his arm. And you see the people in the beer hall start to sing along with them. And the young people are getting into it and fanatical about it, where the older people are, are just shaking their heads thinking, my God. And then Fosse cuts to the MC, Joel Gray is the MC, looking up with that horrifying sneer on his face and nodding that, yeah, it's coming, it's coming. Yeah. I think it's a masterpiece, beautifully directed. Yeah, uh, it's it's so good. Um, I played the hell out of the album that summer. Like, I, I got that, I did. I did. played the hell out of it. Um, another one for saying, I know we've talked about The Godfather, but 72 for me, um, another film. Probably, I'm gonna say, one of my two or three favorite comedies of all time is What's Up, Doc? Again, a Bogdanovich film. Um, but I don't think there's anything funnier than that movie. Um, and again, it's because he cast it perfectly. And I know they didn't have a script that worked from start to finish and they were playing with it all the way through production. But that movie is hysterically funny. Um, it's all about getting a bunch of suitcases mixed up. One has top secrets, one has jewels, one has clothes, one has rocks. Um, and the plot makes zero sense. So it's a true screwball comedy in that sense. But Barbara Streisand, Ryan O'Neill, they were absolutely perfect. Madeline Kahn, uh, Austin Pendleton, the rest of the cast, like really, really well done. And I can put that movie on at any given time and I'm laughing. I don't know. I, I hope somebody else likes it. I do. I do. I, I, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a huge Bogdanovich fan because of his, his ego and he, he got out of control very quickly. But you're absolutely right. It's a fun movie and it's always moving. It's always in motion. Yes. Streisand 
I don't think has ever been given credit for just how good she is as an actress. She won an Academy Award for her first film, Funny Girl. Yeah. And she should, should have won another for The Way We Were, which we'll talk about shortly. But I don't think she's ever gotten credit for being as good an actress as she really is. One of and her I, best... I completely sorry. agree with you. No, I agree. Great film. One of her best performances, 1970, The Owl and the Pussycat. She's great in that. We can talk about that. Great. That's yeah. a great comedy. Like for a two-hander, I mean, there's other people in it, but it's Siegel and Streisand. And she's not always likable. No. In that movie. And she, she goes for it. So. And you know, that's, that's a real fearlessness because actors, I've interviewed you know, hundreds of actors and they like to be liked. So to play somebody dislikable, that's a real courageous choice, especially for a woman. Yeah, although the one thing that makes her cringe now, if I watch it, I still like the movie and I think she's great in it, but she uses the word fag in a way that I can, it just makes my skin crawl. It's like, I know yeah. it's a time, but it's like, oh, Barbara, I think if yeah. you have that to do over again, you'd do it differently. <laughs> not, not politically correct for the time. No, <laughs> no. One of the films from 1972 that I, I got my dad to take me to was John Borman's Deliverance. And is a modern day horror film. It had never occurred to me that a man could be raped. It had never in my life occurred to me. And yet partway through this film, two hillbillies happen upon these, well, these canoers happen upon them. And one of them rapes the Ned Beatty character. Shockingly, realistically, it's horrifying. One of them is about to force John Voight to perform fellatio on him. When suddenly Burt Reynolds, we cut to a shot of Burt Reynolds with his bow and arrow pulled, ready to go. He puts an arrow through the chest of the guy. And everything changes, just, just like that. And it, it, it was stunning that it was, it was set, you know, set in, the, in Tennessee, going down a river. And that all of a sudden, life could be that terrifying and that horrific. Yeah. And so well acted so well written so beautifully performed by burt reynolds who again never really got credit for being the actor he was he should have been nominated for supporting actor for this but that stupid cosmos centerfold cost him a nomination i think deliverance is a masterpiece and it holds up it really does hold up it, it's it's such a good movie and i even my parents i remember coming home they had bought the single of dueling banjos for whatever reason, so oh, really, <laughs> yeah, that banjo music that start that starts the film. That's yeah, that's both creepy and uh, charming. Yeah, for me, Deliverance, I I didn't see it till much later. I watched it on television. It scared the crap out of me. Oh yeah, it's that just last crazy. that last scene where Voight wakes up and the hands coming out of the water. Like, yes, oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I agree with you on Burt Reynolds. I mean, I I think he was his own worst enemy with some things. Um, but there's few performances. I don't think anybody could communicate having a better time on screen in the 70s than he did. Um, you look at The Longest Yard, even Smokey and the Bandit, um, Semi Tough. Like he was, he was a fun guy, and yep. he was yeah. really cool to watch. I think his best work in the 70s is Starting Over. He's really good in that movie. He is good in that. He is good in that. He was, he was a good actor. Yeah. But the Godfather was the year's best film, but what, interesting at the Academy Awards, Cabaret won eight Academy Awards. You know, actress, director, supporting actress, cinematography, editing. And the, the Godfather crew was looking at each other going, my God, we're never going to get up there. And then finally they won screenplay adaptation for Puzo and Coppola. Brando won Best Actor and promptly refused it. And it won Best Picture, which I, I think it deserved Best Picture. I think Coppola should have won Best Director over Fosse. But Fosse's accomplishment is pretty formidable. It's, it's a tough argument. Yeah. In terms of performance, I know we're sticking on 72, but another performance that year I thought was pretty incredible was Diana Ross in Lady Sings of Blues. She was um, great. It was yeah. a phenomenal performance. Not a great movie, um, but she is so freaking good in it. And, and again, she had a couple of other chances, but that was kind of it. It's too bad. It is too bad because I think she was a good actress. She and was very good. I interviewed the director once, Sidney J. Fury, and he was so proud of that film. He thought, we've got an Academy Award winner. She's going to go all the way. And then he said, then Cabaret came out. Yeah. And, and he was right. It knocked, us out, knocked it out. Anything we haven't touched on for 72, guys? I suppose we should mention The Cowboys with John Wayne um, for two reasons. One, it's about to be remade by Tommy Lee Jones, uh, both directing and playing the John Wayne role. 
but it's one of the few films in which halfway through the film, John Wayne is murdered by the Bruce Dern character. And people went into this movie expecting a full-blown John Wayne Western who would lead these little boys to, to heroism, but all of a sudden Bruce Dern shoots them dead and shoots them in the back to boot. And it just turned the whole movie in a different direction. And audiences didn't know what to expect. And Bruce Dern's own father said to him, don't do this movie, you'll be the most hated man in America. And he was for a time, he was. But the courage it took to do that was immense. And I've always believed Bruce Dern to be one of the best actors of the 70s. I think it's shameful what happened to him in the 80s. 1973, um, big year for me because of The Exorcist. Um, I remember seeing this movie when I was probably too young. I think I was 12 going on 13. And um, I think still one of, if not the greatest horror films of all time. What, do you, what are your thoughts, Alan? Um, I saw it when I was 14, again, probably too young. I got was there with my parents, my grandfather and a great aunt, and I don't think they knew what I was getting them into. But I remember I had read the book. Uh, the movie was terrifying, but I have to admit, it took me into my 20s to actually watch that movie and appreciate it. Um, I think it's terrifying. Um, I think there's and it's, it, there's things that are happening on so many different levels that you don't get when you just sit and watch it the first time. Um, I think Friedkin did a great job with the cast and the mood. Um, I just, it, it, even today, I'll put it on, we watch it maybe once a year. Um, and there's that feeling of dread at every time you watch it and the music as well, like the, that chanting, that whatever they call that Gregorian Tubular thing. bells. Tubular bells. I, when Ellen Wilson's walking through Georgetown and it's like, okay, we're back again and you're sucked right in and you got to watch it. Um, I think it's a great movie. I think Ellen Burstyn and Max von Cedar are both amazing in it. And I agree on every level. Um, I saw it when I was very young as well. My dad took me to see it. And I'd read about people fainting in the theater, vomiting in the theater, running out of the theater in horror. And I, you know, I didn't see any of that. I was ready for it. I saw a couple of people get up and leave. And they always left at the same spot. I went to see it several times. And they always left when the girl masturbates with a crucifix. There were images in that film that were absolutely stunning, that we had never seen before, that were startling, that were horrifying. And beyond the projectile vomiting and the flinging her mother across the room, the language, some of the things this kid says that, that come out of her language that the demon is saying to, to rile the people were shocking, absolutely shocking. But I think Friedkin's greatest, greatest achievement, and Alan, you, you touched on it, um, the feeling of dread, walking towards that door and never knowing what was going to be on the, on the other side of it. It might be Karis's mother. It might be Reagan, it might be Reagan healed, it might be a hallucination from someone. They just never knew what they were gonna find on the other side of that door. And I think that's the great horror of, of The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you completely about the acting, beautifully acted. Jason Miller, the, the playwright, who won a Pulitzer Prize for that championship season, is superb as Father Karras. Yeah. And kind of come out of nowhere, you know, Nicholson didn't want it, Pacino didn't want it. This guy took it and ran with it, and a, a great, great film. Mm -hmm. We need to mention the voiceover contribution as well, John. Mercedes McCambridge was a was a little known actress. She got an Academy Award nomination for Giant back in 1956, playing Rock Hudson's sister Luz. And uh, she had won for all the King's Men. Yes, she did. You're right. You're right. And she did the voice of of Reagan, the Demon. And she did it by swallowing raw eggs, by choking herself, by drinking sour milk and then speaking. She put herself through living hell to get that horrifying voice of the demon. And a lot of people, when it came out, thought the kid did it. Reagan, Linda Blair did it because there was no voice credit, which they quickly remedied. Mercedes McCambridge said, hey, guys, come on. So they put a credit in there. And the film won the Academy Award for, for voice, for sound, rather. And I think she absolutely should have been part of that oscar yeah um let's talk about uh 73 other than that um what were we seeing 
Well, let's, well, let's do this. Let me take American Graffiti and Alan, you take the way we were. Is that fair? Yep. Okay. American Graffiti. When, when I was teaching at the Toronto Film School in Humber College, I would always tell the students, American Graffiti will gain in power, in emotion, and in prominence in your life as you get older, as you get further away from high school. Because when you watch American Graffiti when you're 50, wherever you are, if you grew up in a small town, you can watch that film and say, I knew that guy, I was that guy. It's, it's a brilliant film from George Lucas. I think it's the best film he's ever made, certainly his best directed film. Um, he put together a cast of young actors that were rising in Hollywood. Ron Howard, probably the most well-known. Richard Dreyfuss, Candy Clark, Paul Lamont, Mackenzie Phillips, and made this brilliant movie about where were you in 62, the last real year of innocence in the United States before Kennedy was killed. And it's the last night of the summer. And they do what kids in small towns did. They cruise around, they look for girls, they look for a party, and they just have a good time. And at the end of it, Lucas did something brilliant. He made it suddenly melancholy by showing us what happens to each of these kids shortly down the road. John Milner, the hot rod driver, is killed by a drunk driver. Terry the Toad, the, the little geek that falls in love with a blonde bombshell, is missing in action in Vietnam. Steve and Laurie get married and then later get divorced. Kurt runs to Canada to avoid the draft. And all of a sudden, the power of the film settled over you in that that's their future. Is that gonna be our future too? You know, certainly for some of us, it has been that, you know, life is, life can be difficult. So I, I think it's a masterpiece. I think it, it gains in power as the years go by. It certainly has for me and uh, is the best thing Lucas has ever done, produced by Francis Ford Coppola. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's my favorite movie from that year as well. It would have been my pick for best picture. Sure. Me too. Me too. Wonderful. Yeah. So the way we were, which I think is probably Streisand's I alternate between this and Funny Girl, which is her best performance, uh, but it's definitely up there. Um, it's a movie about two misfits. She's the traditional ugly duckling falling in love with Redford, who's the, the golden boy of the American dream. Um, but at a backdrop of World War II and post-World War II um, and the blacklisting. Um, so Streisand's character is very left-wing. Um, Redford isn't, he kind of rides the middle. Um, so it's this love story of two people who are completely attracted to each other. They're attracted to each other's brain, their knowledge, um, their sex appeal, um, but ultimately they can't make it work because of their political differences and how they approach things. Um, I think it's a, it's a good movie. I, for me, the movie is Streisand and Redford. There's not much else about that movie that works um, in, at that level. Um, Sidney Pollack directed. I think he does does a fine job. For me, the fault, the flaw in that film is towards the middle. Toward, I'm going to say halfway through towards the end, um, it kind of falls apart with the whole blacklisting drama. Suddenly, it becomes the true focus. The romance becomes quite secondary, and none of it rang true for me. There's, there's a couple. The scene, I think it's either in a bus station or in, I think it's the bus station or the airport, where Redford and Streisand are going at each other. And it's like, hmm, like I'm not getting it. I, it suddenly didn't seem real. That being said, the romance between those two was in the stratosphere. Um, there wasn't a more dynamic or custom, no two actors had the same chemistry as those two in that whole decade, I don't think. The end of the film where they, where they encounter each other in New York yeah. and the longing and ache that they obviously have for each other is just overpowering. One of the, one of the great endings in movie history and one of the great songs of the 70s, a movie song, The Way We Were. Absolutely. It's a great, it's a great Absolutely. song. No. Um, but it's, it's, some people will sit down with a box of Kleenex and a bottle of wine and they're happy to watch that movie. I love it, and then I don't. And then I love it again. Um, what else should we talk about from this year? Um, the Sting, because it won. Big time it won. And one of yeah. the great travesties of the Academy, I think, that it won so much. It's a very pretty movie. It's a fun movie, um, well-structured, very well put together, a lot of money spent on it, Redford and Newman um, and Robert Shaw. Um, but it's it's just fun. And that's um, it. That's yeah. all it is, yeah, yeah. 
which is okay, which is okay. But I think the I think that winning best picture was the rea reaction against yeah. things like the the Exorcist and Last Tango in Paris and some other things that were happening at the time. It's like no, we want traditional values here, and that this that was, was the closest they kind of a lashing to. back at the youth, you know, yeah. the young people and the changes that were coming in. They were Hollywood wasn't going to have it. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. Um, anything else before we move on? I suppose we should mention Brando in Last Tango in Paris. Um, he had come back and won the Academy Award for The Godfather and then gave the performance of his career the following year in Last Tango in Paris. I don't think he ever did anything greater than this. Mostly improvised. I mean, Bernardo Bertolucci had an idea for a movie. He wrote it down, but they rarely came to set with any actual pages. And he drew on him himself for his character, Paul, this uh, American adrift in Paris after his wife has killed herself. He enters into a purely sexual affair with a young woman and then makes the mistake of falling in love with her. And, and she just doesn't want that. Brando has a monologue over the body of his dead wife that is absolutely paralyzing. And he did it completely off the cuff. There was nothing written down for that. He just spoke it. And I think that level of acting, that level of, of genius is rarely seen these days. He again was nominated for an Oscar. He won all the critics awards, New York, the National Society, he won everything. They nominated him for an Oscar, but no way he's gonna get it the year after he refused it. I mean, that's spitting in the face of the Academy. But I don't think it can be, it can be denied as a, just a stunning work of art. Mm -hmm. 1974 would mark the release of what I know John and I agree on is probably the greatest English language film ever made, the sequel to The Godfather. Yeah, 74 is one of the great years in movie history. I mean, there's just so many fine films. The Godfather Part Two, Chinatown, The Conversation, Lenny, Towering Inferno, Badlands, Young Frankenstein. You can just go on and on and on. But The Godfather Part Two is, is such a, a masterful work of art. Coppola took it further than the first film. It's deeper, it's darker, it's more complex, and it shows the global reach of the mafia. There's that great line that Hyman Roth says to Michael, Mike, we're bigger than U.S. steel. But it also explores that absolute power corrupts absolutely. Michael Corleone finds that he cannot control his family and have his blood family as his father could. He can't find the balance. And the film is also a bookend of sorts to The Godfather. The Godfather fits nicely in the middle of The Godfather Part II because we go back in time and watch how Vito Corleone, the Brando character in The Godfather, came to power, this time played by a young Robert De Niro. And he's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. He suggests a younger Brando. He's got the mannerisms. He's got the voice. He's got that danger that Brando had about him. I mean, yeah, he's a nice old man holding a cat, but he also orders a horse head hacked off and thrown in a guy's bed. Al Pacino, I don't think, was ever better than he was in this film. I think it's shameful that he didn't win the Academy Award um, because it's a, it's a towering performance. And all of the actors around him could have been nominated for Supporting Actor. They had three of the five nominations that year for Best Supporting Actor. Robert Duvall and John Cazell should have been there too. And 11 Academy Award nominations, it tied Chinatown that year for nominations and uh, six Academy Awards, including finally Best Director for Coppola. Alan, any thoughts? Um, I love The Godfather Part Two, but I, when I watch it, I have to watch them both together um, to get the full experience. Part Two, um, I remember seeing it when I was 14, liking it then, watching it again about 15 years later, loving it because I actually understood it um, and got what Coppola was trying to do. Um, for me, the one flaw in that film, um, and it's part of the problem I have with the first one as well, is Diane Keaton. I love Diane Keaton, but she doesn't, she strikes for me, there's a couple of false notes in her performance, both in part one and part two. It's like, it, I find it frustrating because otherwise I think it's an absolutely perfect movie, particularly De Niro. Like, he's stunning in that one. Like this, he is. So he is. In him, when he gets to New York, Little Italy, where he's met his wife and they're, he's starting in the business, uh, he's, he's so good. Like, you see what's happening to him. 
on the corrupting. Um, but he's balancing that because this is ultimately a, a pretty warm guy. I, the Don is very family focused and that comes through. And I love that it doesn't happen with Pacino. He just yeah. can't figure it out. No. You know, he, he orders the execution of his own brother. Yeah. He knows, he knows Fredo didn't know it was gonna be a hit. He knows Fredo's not terribly bright, but he still orders the execution. Yeah. And that, that was cold, man. That was jaw dropping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a great tragedy. And you talk about Pacino's Pacino. performance. We know now Pacino has gotten big and, and loud and hoorah and all that stuff. But this remains his greatest performance. And and the scene where Kay tells him that she's had an abortion, he goes through all the stages of grief. And it's all just on his face. He doesn't even make a sound. Yeah, yeah, it's all internal. All internal. Beautiful. Beautiful. John, you mentioned what a colossal year it was. Um, give us a history lesson. Let's talk about it. Well, I will, but I want to throw Chinatown to Alan because I know it's one of his favorite films. And I'm not, I'm not going to be greedy. So, okay. Alan, you get, you get Chinatown. Okay, and Chinatown for me, and as much as Roman Polanski is a dirty word, and I understand that on some levels, um, but some of his movies are essential for me, one being Rosemary's Baby, the other one being Chinatown. Um, and for me, this movie, I can you can watch it multiple times and you're still picking up things that he's put in there. Yes. Uh, it's this story, it's a detective story basically um, about corruption and interestingly enough coming out the year that watergate was coming to a head so it's about political corruption on a much smaller scale um and family secrets and the mysterious um mrs mulray played by faye dunaway hiring jack nicholson to well not actually diane line diane line hires him first but faye dunaway gets in there later but they're both playing the same character um to basically investigate what's going on. And you, you see the layers getting peeled back. Um, and it, it's, for me, it's, it's a tense film. It's a beautiful film. I liked watching the relationship between Nicholson's character, J.J. Giddies, and Faye Dunaway's character. I like watching that grow. I like the cynicism that you're seeing throughout the whole thing. Um, and I just, it's just, there's this whole, real sense of unease as you're watching it from start to finish. Um, but they, what Polanski and the set designers in town, the writer have done, like, like they truly recreated, I, I, they picked 1937 and I think it was the ideal year because you're capturing uh, LA at a time when the depression is on the downswing, the prosperity starting is just before the war. So you're getting a real sense of what that, what that town probably looked like and felt like back then. Um, wow. And I just think it's pretty brilliant. And for me, the score, Jerry Goldsmith's music on the opening credits and throughout the whole thing, I think it's the best score of the year and probably the best score of the decade. And I will say that even though The Godfather's up there as well, I love that music. A mournful horn over the opening yeah. titles is, is yeah. just haunting. Once you've heard it, you can't not hear it. And this also, is, for me, it's, sorry, Faye Dunaway. Um, like she was a tough one, right? I mean, she, I think she probably is a little challenged. I think she's there's some something going on there with her because no director wants to work with her twice. She's a um, diva. She's a diva. Nobody wants her. I, I think there might be a bit of bipolar. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> but there's something there. But that being said, what she brought to that character, that tension, that neurotic undertone that she kind of you see in all her performances, it never worked better for her. And I know Jane Fonda was close to getting this part. Yeah. I don't think it would have been the same. I don't think so either. I think Faye Dunaway brought a, a real brittle aspect to her character. Yeah. And she was broken. Something in her mind was broken because of what happened to her with her father. Yeah. And I think the performance of John Houston never got enough credit. I think he is one of the most vile creations in movie history. Yes. This, this corrupt, old man and you can almost see the corruption oozing out of him and yeah. when we realize that he's raped his daughter and and fathered a child it's horrifying absolutely horrifying i'm listening to angelica the first volume of angelica houston's book right now and there's a it's fun i think there's a lot about her dad in there and i'm yeah. having trouble liking the guy because i keep my image of him is from chinatown 
I know. I know he's a direct, but I mean, she, she's talking about how great her dad was. It's like, oh my God. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was quite a guy. He was a real adventurer. He, he lived large. Yes. I think he liked himself too. <laughs> yes, he did. Yes, he did. And Nick, you asked me about why 74 was, was so terrific. You had a bunch of directors who released films simultaneously. Uh, you had Coppola with The Godfather Part Two and The Conversation, another great film about wiretapping, very, very timely, uh, stunning performance from Gene Hackman, a near silent performance from Gene Hackman. And Coppola had two films in the running that year for Best Picture, The Godfather Part Two, which won, and The Conversation. Bob Fosse was back with his biography of Lenny Bruce, was a, a superb Dustin Hoffman performance as the, the first real comedian commentator Lenny Bruce, uh, The Towering Inferno, one of the, the better of the disaster movies, came out in 74. Badlands, Terrence Malick's sparse study, you know, based on the Godard theory, a guy, a girl, and a gun. Well, that's exactly what it is. But it's also based on the murders of Charles Starkweather in 1959 in Lincoln, Nebraska. Young Frankenstein, one of the, the oh, well, I think the greatest parody ever made, you know, a great parody of universal horror films. Phantom of the Paradise, a wonderful rock version of Phantom of the Opera. Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, A Woman Under the Influence, The Great Gatsby. It was just a superb year for movies. Yeah, I, The Longest Day. Um, trying to think yeah. of something. Yeah. Um, the one I'm going to touch on really briefly, the biggest disappointment for that year is Maine. Um, <laughs> I'm not touching that. Go for it. <laughs> um, the last gasp, I think, of the big time musicals that were had kind of died out in the 69, 70, when a lot of money was thrown against these big musicals and they, nobody wanted to go see them. Um, so Maine came to the screen in 74 with Lucille Ball. And it wouldn't have gotten made, I don't think, without her because she put her money behind it. I'm a huge Lucy fan. And I think Lucy as Maine is something that probably could have sold in a big way 15 years earlier. Um, but by 1974, she was just a little too old. Her voice was a little too shot. And the director was just way too old fashioned. And that didn't work. As much as I can sit and watch that movie and enjoy pieces of it with what Lucy does at various points, um, it's, it's really ultimately quite sad to watch because of what, what it could have been. Um, I saw it in 74 and yeah. have never seen it again. And I'm sorry, but I have no desire to ever see it again. I, I agree, 15 years earlier, you might have had a great film, but. It's just, it, everything was too dated. It was, it had passed its prime. Yep, and absolutely. I, just people say, if you put it, if you had put the original star, Angela Lansbury in, no, nah, I don't think so. I don't think it would have worked. I don't think, I don't think it, would, it wouldn't have mattered. It wouldn't have mattered. We have mentioned uh, Jaws a lot of times uh, already on the limited number of shows that we've done, but in 1975, uh, it was a monumental year because of that film and how it changed the movie season. Um, John, can you tell us a little bit about how things were before Jaws and how they were forever changed afterwards? Well, movies before were, were just released when they were done. You know, the studio would cut them and, and there'd be a waiting period. And a lot of the big ones, you know, there are a lot of the platform films were Christmas releases, but there, there was no strategic plan like there is right now. If you go online right now, you can find what the movie releases are going to be up as far as 2022. They've got it mapped out. Jaws was, was such a sensation in the summer that it forever created the blockbuster season. So from January to April, we have kind of the films that the studios don't know what to do with. Uh, the summertime is blockbuster, pure entertainment, popcorn movies, once in a while, uh, Academy Award material, Saving Private Ryan. And then from September to December, we have the, the prestige films, the award season. And that's absolutely because of Jaws and what Steven Spielberg accomplished with that film. Um, if, am I understanding correctly that they, the studio wanted to release it around Christmas? They were going to. They were going to release it at uh, Christmas of 1974. But there were two key scenes that weren't complete. And the first was the scene in, in, uh, where they go underwater and find Ben Gardner's boat and the head pops out and Richard Dreyfuss is, is terrified. They shot that in the film editor's pool and inserted it afterwards. And then of course the famous, the, the scene where the shark comes out of the water when Scheider's throwing in the chum. That wasn't in the film at that point either. They did a, a retake with that with Roy Scheider 
again in a studio tank and uh, cut it in and, and perfect. They got the screams they wanted. So they bumped it to June of, uh, of 75 and massive hit. I, just, I can't describe how big a hit it was. It played in the same theater in Oshawa all summer long, the entire summer of 1975. Alan, did you see it in the theater that summer? I did. I went with one of my cousins, and um, she was a little too young to be going, but I took her anyway. And <laughs> we, I remember the scene with the head popping out, and the, our popcorn went up in the air, and everybody screamed. And we—I think we were lined up again two days later to go back and see it again. So, so and I think that's how Jaws made a lot of its money was repeat business. I, I saw it ten times that summer easily, and what people forget is how really truly great a film it is beautifully directed by spielberg directed to genius and so well acted uh, robert robert shaw should have won the academy award that year for supporting actor just just a, a near perfect film i really like roy scheider in it too i think he's, he's terrific he, yeah. they all are i mean they're all flawless richard dreyfus is, is very good so um cinemas were booming obviously in the summer of 1975 um there's a lot of important films that came out this year. Uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, Dog Day Afternoon. I mean, where do we start? You go ahead, Alan. You take this one. Well, one of the ones that got me, and I didn't see it in 1975. I probably saw it about seven or eight years later, was Shampoo. Yes. Uh, and I, I, one of my favorite films of the decade and probably my favorite comedy from that year. Um, but it, it's not... A laugh out loud funny film. It's just what I love about Shampoo is that even though it's set in 1968 but was released in 75, it feels like a time capsule of 1968. I, yeah. I love that feel of that film because I think it's set right around the eve of Nixon's election to the White House. Um, I don't know, it just it really captured the spirit at the time. It has a very French feel to it as well, even though it's set in Southern California. Um, but just the rondelay with Beatty and all his women and his juggling and trying to, everything was so free and easy, but the, ultimately there's a price to pay for everything. And I just think it's a really, really good movie that stood the test of time. And I think that's primarily, I think Beatty and Robert Town did the screenplay, if I'm remembering correctly. Yes. Uh, and Al, Hal Ashby directed. And, uh, it, for me, it's one of Ashby's iconic films because it, it's just, it's got a laziness to it or, it just kind of flows like nothing really much happens, but all of a sudden it, there's a very profound statement towards the end. I, I love so, it. So sharply written, you know, by town. You're, you're absolutely right. And the, uh, the, the final tragedy, the human tragedy of the movie is, is beautifully set up by Ashby and so well acted by everybody. I think this is one of Beatty's best performances. Yeah, I do too. And I mean, the, the Goldie Hawn, the ladies are good. Goldie Hawn's very good, Julie Christie's good. Lee Grant won her Oscar for it. I'm not sure yeah. I would have given it to her for that, but she's excellent in it. And Carrie Fisher, um, yes. you know, screen debut and really fun couple scenes as Lee Grant's daughter. Yes. Um, a great year for performances, uh, Dog Day Afternoon. I mean, Al Pacino was a firing on all cylinders in the 70s. Um, I think he's electric in every scene of this movie. Dog Day Afternoon was a big hit in the summer of 1975. And it was, again, one of those movies that was a blockbuster, but was also a work of art, incredibly well-reviewed by the critics. Um, Sidney Lumet directed the film. Pacino played Sonny. It's based on a true story of a completely botched bank robbery. And it's got so much humor in it. You know, John Cazell asks where he wants to go on the plane and he answers Wyoming. Deadpan, beautiful delivery. But you're absolutely right about Pacino. Front and center, he is electrifying, especially in the scenes in front of the bank when he's playing to the crowd. Um, an extraordinary actor. And I mean, everything he did in the 70s was so terrific, except Bobby Deerfield, it was junk. But uh, I long for what he did in the 70s because of what he's doing now. Yeah. I, I remember seeing that movie at, at the time. And one of the other performances that stuck out for me still, like, what, 45 years later, Charles Durning as the cop. He's terrific. He's so he, good in it. Yeah, just a wonderful character actor. And Chris Sarandon as Pacino's lover has, yeah. has a, a, I think, a seven-minute scene. And he was nominated for an Academy Award. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, Eva, and the grit and feel of New York at that time as well, because New York wasn't a great place at that point. Like, 
No, I think this film and Taxi Driver sum up New York in the 1970s. New York was an open sewer, you know, filled with crime, prostitutes, just a horror show. And this movie and Taxi Driver the following year capture that perfectly. Yeah. There's a real sense of claustrophobia and like fluorescent lighting in, in Dog Day Afternoon once they're pigeonholed in that situation. Um, and you can just see the panic and the stress on uh, Pacino's face all throughout. Um, it looks like it was shot with just a lot of natural lighting in the, sh in the location. Is that right? I believe it was. And I think it was shot in sequence. I think they started right at the beginning and shot in order all the way through, which, which is rare. But Lamette did that on several of his movies. And uh, for this one, I think it was a great choice because it allowed them to build to that, that great crescendo at the end where they, well, it's not a spoiler 40 years later where they're taken out. You know, it's a absolute masterpiece. Six Academy Award nominations, all richly deserved. There was a big argument that year that Pacino maybe should have won. Maybe he should have bested Nicholson in Cuckoo's Nest, which I don't believe for a minute. I think Cuckoo's Nest is Nicholson's best work. Well, let's talk about it then. Do you uh, want to take this one, Alan? No, you, uh, you're more familiar with Cuckoo's Nest than I am. I, I, okay. I, this is your movie. Okay, Kirk Douglas owned the rights to One Flew to Cuckoo's Nest uh, through, the, through the 60s, and he couldn't get a film made of it. He tried and tried and tried and tried, and he wanted to play McMurphy, but no one would touch it. So he did get a Broadway production mounted, and in the 70s, gave the rights to the book to his son, Michael, and said, if you can get a movie made of this, go for it. Michael tried to, nobody would touch it. So he went to the record producer, Saul Zantz, who became a movie mogul after this, and Zantz gave him the money and the absolute freedom to make his film. He hired director Milos Forman, the Czechoslovakian director, to make the film because he wanted it to have a European look, a near documentary look. And there was nobody but Jack Nicholson they wanted for McMurphy. He was it, and he took the part. Every actress in Hollywood was offered Nurse Ratchet, Jane Fonda, Anne Bancroft, Ellen Burstyn, Shirley MacLaine. None of them wanted to play the part. They all said the same thing. We don't want to play a monster. And they eventually cast Louise Fletcher, who was kind of a minor actress in Robert Altman's films. And the movie opened and the reviews were absolutely astonishing, absolute raves. The only word I can think of to describe Jack Nicholson in this movie is breathtaking. His performance is utterly breathtaking in every frame. And the supporting category or the supporting actors equally so. There's, there's not a flaw in the movie. It's a masterpiece. Alan, would you agree? Oh, totally agree. I, I haven't seen it enough. I've probably seen it about three or four times over the last 45 years. Um, but for me, it's my second favorite Nicholson performance. I will... I, I, I dislike him a little bit more in Chinatown, um, but One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is great, and Louise Fletcher, I could never warm up to her afterwards. She no, no, you're absolutely right. She, she was ice cold in Cuckoo's Nest. She metaphorically castrated all those men. Yeah. And you just, you couldn't get near her after that, I, that actress. I remember when she won the Oscar and she went up there and she looked very pretty. And she yeah. made a lovely speech. Um, and signed it in sign language. Yep. I thought, yep. okay, that's not the same person. No, no, her range is extraordinary. And what a what a gutsy move for her to take that part. Yeah. The other one I want to touch on for 75, the one movie for me is, I, I didn't get it when I first saw it, but I've watched it a few times since, and I now see it for what it is. A really good, great time capsule is Nashville, um, Robert Altman's film. Um, basically looking at the American psyche at that point in time, but using country music as the backdrop. Um, love that movie. And I love the characters that were, came in and out of there. I don't think it was the story was particularly linear in any way or really deep or great, definitely wasn't plot driven. Um, but I love watching that movie. It's almost like a quilt. Uh, there's so many different pieces to it and it all just somehow fits together. That's a great analogy. And one of the stories I heard about, about Nashville was that they would set up in the morning, smoke some pot, shoot some movie, a lot yeah. of improvisation, smoke some more pot, shoot some more movie. Again, improvisation. Yeah. They had a script, a working script, but they pretty much came and did what they want. And that became an Altman thing. All these, these characters, all the stories intertwining. To, so eventually we do have a narrative, but we don't figure it out till the end. 
and yeah. that became a real trademark of Robert Altman. And Paul Paul Thomas Anderson has taken that on with Boogie Nights, Magnolia. You know, he pays homage to Altman in all of his films. But you're yeah. absolutely right. It was it was a massive film at the time. Pauline Kael raved about it, and mm -hmm. you know, people were waiting for it because of Pauline Kael's review. Yeah, that was a good one. There was a film released in 75, which has become sort of unique uh, in the cinematic world as, so it's got, it's developed a cult following that's massive and that's the Rocky Horror Picture Show. We were talking about Jaws and repeat viewings and stuff. People go to see this movie still to this day. Yes, they do. And I have to admit in my teenage days, I attended the Roxy Cinema on Bloor Street and uh, watched the party. He didn't go to watch the film. He went to watch the party. Incredibly, at, at the height peak of its, its, its power, I guess, it was re-released in cinemas in 1978. And I went to see it one night with the girl I was with, and we were the only two people in the 7 o'clock show. So I got to see the movie and just focus on the movie. And it's a lot of fun. It's, it's not a particularly great musical, yeah. but Tim, Tim Curry is so charismatic as Frankenfurter. And the songs are, are hummable. Good film. Good film. Not a great film, but a good film. Yeah, the first time I saw it, I think I was well, probably inebriated sitting on the floor of some gym in Oshawa somewhere. Um, I will say at the time, I probably didn't get it, but I've seen it since. It's, it's a fun movie. Not one I have to watch all the time, though. No, no, me neither. Me neither. One other we should touch on for 75, Nick, is Barry Lyndon, Stanley Kubrick's film. I was just about to mention it, yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. No, um, I don't like you take this one. You like this film a lot. To me? Yeah. Yeah, you take it. You love this yeah, movie. I do. I, and for me, I mean, it's it's based on a Thackeray novel, I think. Um, the story of one, I'm going to get the plot wrong because it's been a while since I've seen it, but uh, Barry Lyndon's an orphan and he ends up doing well um, through marriage and whatever. But for me, it's a, it's the visuals of this one. Um, I remember sitting in the theater and I was probably 15 years old and it just, it, un, it unspooled very slowly. I think it's got to be what, about three hours long. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I was fascinated by just looking at it, like the details. You felt like you were in 18th century England in this movie. It was absolutely beautiful. Like the lighting of the candles. And I, th I think in some scenes, Kubrick just used the candles to light. Yes, he did. Uh, the costume design, the, the set decoration, the green, uh, the countryside. It's just one of the most beautiful movies to look at for me. It almost feels sometimes like Kubrick went back in time, you yeah. know, because the, the, you're absolutely right. The greenery, the lush, the lush forests and valleys. It's just so spectacular to look at. And those red army uniforms against that green. And the candlelight scenes, he actually borrowed lenses from NASA to oh, shoot wow. the scenes, and uh, it, it's a masterpiece. When I saw it the first time, like you, I thought, well, it's a little slow, but I went back to see it a second time and just fell into the story, fell into the visuals, the look of it, the beauty of it, and the difficulty it must have been in making it. And, and to this day, I think it's one of his best films, one of his most underrated films. Yeah, I, I would say it's in my top one or two for him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anything else we want to touch on for 75? Um, Mr. Cogburn, we want to talk about that? We could quickly. I mean, it's... it's <laughs> I was sort of being tongue-in-cheek, but... Yeah, for what it is, it's a remake of The African Queen without being an official remake of The African Queen. I think the nicest thing to say about Rooster Cogburn is that John Wayne and Catherine Hepburn had wonderful chemistry together and worked well together. Yeah, it's yeah. not it's not a great film it's not true grit but it offered two legends the chance to work together and they did not disappoint their chemistry was superb and a little bit of trivia on that one if you go on internet movie database you look at uh, casting uh initially john wayne wanted somebody younger um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not hard. um and he wanted mary tyler moore Is um, that, i didn't know that i knew he yeah. wanted younger, but i didn't know it was her yeah, um, because that made more sense because Catherine Hepburn's character had a father in that movie. And it's like, well, how friggin' old Miss T must have been. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so that didn't 
happened and as a married telemark fan i thought okay that would have been cool watching those two it together cool. so. it would have been cool she worked with elvis it would have been cool to work with john wayne yeah um another sequel that came out in 75 just before we move on i want to mention this because john aren't you of the opinion that french connection 2 surpasses the original i am i am i i love the french connection the original i think it's beautifully directed well acted by gene hackman but i think the character study in French Connection 2 is just a bit more powerful. The way Popeye Doyle, Gene Hackman again, goes to France to track down Charnier and the cartel. They kidnap him and addict him to heroin. And I thought Hackman's performance just, just went to another level with this film. It was directed by John Frankenheimer, who was off and on. He could direct good films and then he'd knock one out of the park like this and a, a film we'll get to in 77 called Black Sunday. And I really liked it. I saw it the summer of 75, three or four times. And I think it holds up. And I've watched them back to back. And yeah, I, I stand by that. I think the second film is a stronger picture. Hmm. I've never seen the second one. I'm going to have to watch that. I've got it. I've got it. Also, I'll send it along to you. All right. Okay. In 1976, or sorry, for 1976, the Academy Awards decided that Rocky was the best picture of the year. Not controversial at all, right? It well, wasn't at the time. No, you're right. It was not at the time. It was a widely admired movie. But come yeah. on. Let's be honest here. Look at everything that came out in 1976. We're talking about Taxi Driver, All the President's Men, Network. Uh, the list goes on and on. Yeah. It was an extraordinary year for movies. There, there's no two ways about it. And now you look back and yeah you see taxi driver you see i think all the president's men was the year's best film but a lot of people think network was the year's best film either or all of the nominated films i think were stronger pictures than rocky but rocky tapped into something that nobody saw coming you know all of a sudden movies had been dark all through the 1970s and we're dealing with with sometimes nasty subject matter and rocky was a was a love story it was a cinderella story about a guy who's been a loser all his life and he gets a chance to be something mm -hmm. and it was the first time in my life i remember audiences cheering in the theater i'd never heard that before and they lost their mind during that final fight it, it was it was quite something to see yeah it was it was and that score of the song gonna fly now oh uh, well. And I mean, it was everywhere. You couldn't get away from that that, that Christmas yeah. scene. Yeah. And, and Stallone, you know, despite his, his lack of real skill as an actor, was a complete original. We'd never seen anybody like, like Rocky Balboa before, like Sylvester Stallone before. And six months after Rocky came out, I remember reading in a, in a Hollywood trade paper that they were gonna remake A Streetcar Named Desire with Stallone and Faye Dunaway, which would have been grotesque. I mean, can you imagine? And very quickly after Rocky, they realized he couldn't do much else other than Rocky and then later Rambo. But man, that first time, he was something else. Yep. Um, Carrie also was released in 1976. Uh, we must have lost count at how many Stephen King adaptations have been made into movies at this point, right? But... Um, this was a seminal piece of work, Brian De Palma, and um, let's talk about what it did for the horror genre, because that's going to be touched on again as we get later into the 70s. Um, John, where do you want to start? Carrie, Carrie was kind of a surprise. It kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, De Palma was a rising director. He'd made a great cult film called Phantom of the Paradise that, that I just love. I think that's one of the best films of the 70s. And he'd made a pretty decent love story called Obsession. And when Carrie came out, it was this very strange horror film with this odd looking girl, Sissy Spacek, and her, her crazy lunatic mother, Piper Laurie. And the end of it is just an absolute bloodbath. And then you've got that shock ending where the hand comes out of the grave at the, at the end of the picture. And audiences just lost their minds for it. You know, it was a big success. And then Spacek and, and Laurie are both nominated for Academy Awards, Best Actress, Best Supporting Actress. So it was much more than just a standard horror film. It was, it was something pretty special in 76. Yeah. Another film looking at uh, darker elements of society and like, Joker was a big thing last year and we can't obviously ignore the influence Taxi Driver had on it. Um, 
John, you saw Joker as almost a horror film. Do you think there are notes of that in Taxi Driver 2, or where, where does that come from? Yeah, the first time I saw Taxi Driver, I, uh, I saw it at a matinee on a Saturday afternoon. And I, I come out of the movie shaken. I'd never seen violence like that. The, the level of violence in Taxi Driver shocked me, and I'm not squeamish at all. But watching a, a guy like Travis Bickle just descend into insanity for two hours, you know he's going to go off. He's a time bomb. And when he goes off, it was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It was absolute carnage. And he puts that, that finger up to his head and pretends to shoot himself when the cops come into the room. And he's telling them, shoot me, please shoot me, because that's what he wants anyway, is to die. And then at the end of it, when he picks up his former girlfriend, you catch that look in his eye. He's going to do it again. He will absolutely do it again. He got off and, you know, an extraordinary movie. Martin Scorsese captured New York as it was. There's that great shot at the beginning of the movie where there's steam coming up from one of the sewer grates. And it's like the sewer grates, the only thing holding back hell from bursting onto the streets of New York. It, just a remarkable movie. De Niro, my God, he was so good in that film. He was. I, think, I think you told me when I was your student that he was flying to Sicily on the weekends, working on The Godfather Part Two, and working as an actual cab driver during the week. Ab absolutely true. Absolutely true. He was in Sicily, learning the lingo, and coming back and driving cab. You know, and he drove in some of the toughest parts of New York just to, just to learn the part. You know, method acting, hardcore method acting. Um, let's talk about all the president's men. Uh, I unfortunately wasn't around during the 70s. I can't speak to the political climate, but was that the first kind of movie of its kind? You go ahead, Alan. Alan? I'll take it, Nick, till we figure out what's going on. Did Alan drop out? He's not there. Um, all right, I'm going to pause recording just so I don't have a bunch of extra dead air. Okay. Uh, Alan, I don't know if you can hear me, but we can't hear you. Okay. Uh, I had just, I don't know if you heard it, Alan, but I had just thrown all the president's men to you if you want it. Sure. Um, okay. we just watched it last night. Um, it was on Turner. Uh, it's one of my favorite, a, again, great movie. And what I love about All the President's Men is the fact that that's recent history. That movie came out two years after everything happened and you're still sitting there on the edge of your street wondering how it's all going to play out. Um, and as we were watching it last night, I mean, it talks, it's about the downfall of the Nixon administration um, and the cover up of the Watergate burglary and what that was just symptomatic of in terms of what the, the, that administration was actually covering up. Um, but I was fascinated by the depiction of journalism then as compared to now, um, because those guys had to really work. Investigative journalism wasn't doing things on the internet. It wasn't going online and trying to find out stuff. You had to go door to door. You had to pick up the phone. You had to get people to talk to you. Um, and it, it was a really interesting just to watch that in that context. And what I was also amazed at the fact that they, the number of people that they actually did get to talk to them. Um, yeah the work that went in to building that story from this little break in until ultimately something that brings down the president of the United States, the tension, the pace, uh, Redford and Hoffman are excellent. So is Jason Robards. I just love the way Alan J. Pakula pulled that together. Cause it really, even now 45, 46 years later, it's like you're on the edge of your seat. I think the greatest thing Pakula did in making that movie, first of all, the screenplay, makes sense of Watergate, starts at the beginning yes, yes. and moves, moves us right through to Nixon being reelected. And Alan J. Pakula made it a detective story, which was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And you're right about the portrayal of journalism. There's that great shot in the Library of Congress where they're going through library cards, trying to find out who, who had a book. And the camera goes up higher and higher and higher until we're looking down on them and their ants in this, this huge, city of Washington trying to trying to fight a system that's clearly fighting them. Mm -hmm. And it was just a knockout. One of the most intelligent films I think I've ever seen. I think it was by far the year's best movie. And uh, unfortunately, didn't get the Oscar it deserved. 
what it's interesting when what we watched the post again recently from a couple years ago also a really good movie uh, but when you watch the post and then at the end of the post it's segueing into what's happening in all the president's men a great deal yes. that's yes. a great deal it's great it's it's a great moment the other the other i think incredibly important and influential movie and foreshadowing film from 76 was Sidney Lumet's Network, which is also chilling. There, there's that scene at the end of the film where they don't know what to do with Howard Beale. And they sit in a, in a normal boardroom and these guys in suits say, well, I guess we could kill him. And that's exactly what they do live on the air. Television in network becomes a bunch of reality television programming, which is what television became. And Paddy Chayevsky had no way of knowing that in 1976, yet he predicted it. And Sidney Lumet made a, a brilliant movie, a brilliant black comedy about where television was going. So well acted by, by everybody. The only thing I have problem with is Peter Finch winning Best Actor. I think it was a supporting role. I think William Holden should have been the lone Best Actor for it, and, and Finch should have been supporting, and he probably would have won. But again, this could have gone toe to toe with all the presidents meant for best picture. Either could have won and I'd, I'd never complain again. Yeah, well, yes, I would. Yes, I would. But. <laughs> for, for me, that network, the heart of that movie is Faye Dunaway. Um, and she's chilling because there's absolutely zero emotion to that character. She's just- You're right. Like, and he's oh, got that great line to her, your television incarnate, Diana. Uh, and he's absolutely right. Yeah, she's just drive. That's yeah. it. Yeah, I don't. I don't think she was ever better. I know. I know you love her in Chinatown, but I don't think she was ever better than she was here. Yeah, well, I agree. I think this is her best performance. Um, I do love her in Chinatown, though. Um, speaking on, we mentioned the horror genre earlier with Carrie. Nineteen seventy six also saw the release of Richard Donner's The Omen. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, you want to take this out? Um, sure. I, it's good. It's it's feels it exists solely because of The Exorcist. I think um, if The Exorcist hadn't have happened, we wouldn't have got The Omen. Um, there are moments in it that are pretty terrifying, um, particularly with the kid and the nanny. That's my favorite scary moment in that whole thing. And when he pushes his mother, or uh, I can't even remember how that all plays out, but she ends up falling from the chandelier. Yeah, um, uh, it's good. It feels to me it's it, you know, it's almost like a high-end TV movie. That's what that one feels like to me. It doesn't feel like it has the, the, the gravity behind it. It's fun. It's a little scary. I think Gregory Peck's way too old for Lee Remick in that movie. That's always bothered me. Um, but yeah, it's okay. I and thought it, they could have searched the world over and not found a better looking kid. Harvey Stevens was his name. He played yeah, he little was creepy. He, he was creepy, creepy looking. The other thing I like about it a lot is the musical score by Jerry Goldsmith, one of the great scores of the 70s. Anything else from 76 you want to touch on before moving on? Just briefly, maybe maybe two more if I may. Um, Alan, I want you to jump in on this one though. Barbara Streisand and John Peters produced The Star is Born, a remake of the Judy Garland film. Right. And this became notorious for their behavior on the set. And when the film came out, um, I was always bothered by the, the ego trip that Streisand seemed to be taking. Way too many close-ups, way too many close-ups. And yet the performance of Chris Christopherson was superb as this burnt out rock and roll singer. He was absolutely stunning. And the movie made a fortune, won I think five Golden Globes, but critics massacred it, absolutely crucified it. And I, I was never 100% sure why they were so rough on it. Alan. I think, uh, <laughs> I'm going to say it's her. Um, that's why there was, it was her and him, because she produced that with her then boyfriend, John Peters, right? And yeah. he, I think he was a bit of a dick, and he allowed her to be a bit of a dick on this one. Um, I think she's a very, I love Streisand. I'm the biggest Streisand fan in terms of her singing that there yep. is. Yep. Um, where I struggle with her as an actress sometimes, and I think A Star is Born shows everything that she's not good at. Um, she needs a strong director to bring out the vulnerable side of her. She can't play vulnerable. Um, she's got to, like, it's not something that comes natural to her on screen. 
Is, uh, there a, is there a director out there that could actually direct her now, or has she got to the point where she's she's undirectable? Uh, for me, she's like Cher at this point because the where they are and what they represent, they can't play real people anymore. No, I thought she had a chance to give a really great performance in a film called Nuts. Yeah. And it, it just didn't happen. You know, Mark Riddell directed it. She took over directing. It was Martin Ritt. Martin Ritt, I'm sorry. You're yeah. absolutely right. I did, I did think she did a wonderful job directing The Prince of Tides. So do I. Yeah. I think she was woefully miscast. I, I would have loved to have seen her cast Veronica Hamill from Hill Street Blues oh, yeah. as, as Dr. Lowenstein. But wonderful job directing. Yeah, it says, and a star is born, though, there's so many close-ups. It was all about her butt and her hair and, I don't know, because there's so many but, I'm glad you said that, because I got, I got tired of looking at her butt. I really did. But that being said, the score is terrific. Um, is like great songs. Really great songs. Um, and no movie made more money for her than that one. No, it was a huge blockbuster in 1976. I think... It made more money than the remake of King Kong, which was oh yeah, one of the highest anticipated films of the year and was just a piece of junk. Just a dreadful movie. The only the only saving grace in King Kong was Jessica Lang. The rest yeah. of it was just awful. Did you see it, Alan? In, in I the- did, and I've seen a little bit of it since and I can't even watch it. No, no, it really is unwatchable. I don't know it's what a great the- story about Meryl Streep auditioning for that role. Yes. Um yeah. uh, well, you've probably seen it anyway. I'll tell it anyway. It's like, well, yeah, it's all. And it was Dino De Laurentiis' son had seen her, brought her in to audition for the senior De Laurentiis. And it's like in Italian, he says, Why'd you bring me this ugly person for this part? And she understood Italian and said, I'm sorry, I'm not beautiful enough to be in your movie of King Kong. So. <laughs> I was literally just watching Peter Jackson's King Kong before we started this call. I there love that one. That's a great movie. Oh, yeah, of course. Andy Serkis, greatest actor in the world. Um, film. What was the other 76 film you wanted to address? That was it, King Kong. Just, oh, just okay, cool. King Kong in passing. In 1977, we saw a little movie called Star Wars, along with a lot of other stuff. But um, May, the, May the 4th is coming up. I fear that, John, you and I may have to do a Star Wars episode. But let's just briefly talk about what that was like in that day when star wars hit the big screen it was absolute mania i mean it was pandemonium almost from the the opening day i saw star wars opening day um and i'll never forget the opening scene you have the title crawl which was really interesting hadn't seen that for years and then you see a ship go off into the distance firing backwards and then you see the star destroyer at the top of the screen and it just kept going the friggin thing was massive and that was it i was in i was in it's a it's a absolute fantasy it's a western in space great fun interesting characters none of them really great actors although harrison ford became a great actor i think through time and we got to know the characters through the sequels through the empire strikes back which is a better film and return of the jedi which is a good film but star wars became something bigger than the movie, became a pulp culture phenomenon, and forever changed the film industry. People forget it was nominated for 10 Academy Awards. It won seven, you know, which, which is not a slouch at all. Gravity won seven. So it was it was a big movie at the time. Alan, did you see it when it came out? I saw it. I saw all three of the original ones. I'm going to leave it for others to talk about Star Wars. I, I, I never got into it in the same way. I have an appreciation for it. Um, saw the first three, didn't see the second three, and saw the last three. So. I, um, I, yeah. obviously, <laughs> it was before my time, uh, but in 1997, when George Lucas re released Star Wars in theaters with all of his changes and whatever, my father made it a point of taking me to go see them in the theater because I'd never seen them, and it actually was a pretty big deal. Um, we also got Close Encounters of the Third Kind that year. So Lucas's good buddy uh, also was dealing with extraterrestrials in outer space. And John, I know you love this movie. Um, I do. My brother and I made the trip into Toronto to see it at the York Cinema. And we're absolutely blown away. I, we were with, like everyone else at the end of the film who was weeping. 
And when we came out, CTV News was there interviewing people who'd seen the film. And there was this black lady we were standing behind and they were talking to her. And she said, the final 45 minutes are like seeing God. And Steve and I looked at each other and yep, absolutely. It was a stunner, an absolute stunner. If contact ever happens between mankind and an alien race, and I do believe it will someday, I hope this is how it happens, peacefully and uh, with respect for each other. Because Spielberg, Spielberg captured that on every level. That last 45 minutes is just a remarkable bit of filmmaking and special effects. Wondrous, a miracle on screen. Agreed. Yeah, we, I saw that, a, that was my, actually one of my favorite movies that year. Um, went back a couple times because I don't think I got it the first time um, in terms of how all these people were connected. But yeah, yeah. I've watched yeah. it multiple times since. I love it. And I love the score for that movie as well. And I thought it was the best film of 1977. I was absolutely stunned when it wasn't nominated for Best Picture. Eight nominations, including Best Director, but not Best Picture. Yet Star Wars gets 10 nominations, including Picture and Director. I thought Close Encounters was the better film. Yeah, it was. I think in its slot would have been taken probably by The Goodbye Girl. Likely, which just, I don't know, makes my stomach turn <laughs> a little bit. 70, yeah. 70, 77 was a great year for women on screen. And uh, there were just so many really great performances from women. You know, Diane Keaton and Annie Hall, Diane Keaton and Looking for Mr. Goodbar, and just on and on and on and on. Do you want to tackle a couple of those, Alan? Sure. Um, a couple of them. Um, Julia uh, with Jane Fonda and Vanessa Redgrave. Love yeah. That movie. Um, I, I think it's an excellent it's it's a mystery it shows the relationship between Lillian Hellman and Dashiell Hammett which is fascinating to watch because I don't think it's easy to portray writers on screen but those two bring it off um, and Alvin Sargent's screenplay is really strong um, but it's also the mystery of getting the money to Julia um, to help with the resistance um, I just think it's a great movie like a big old-fashioned glossy drama um, set in wartime um, but beautifully done. Like it's, it was a kind of the, one of the last of those types of movies that you saw at that point. Like it's yep. something that if this had been filmed in 1957 instead of 77, you, it, you'd, you would have got it. And I'm not saying that it was dated. It just, it felt like it had that big studio feel to it. And yes, you're right. with, a, with a really, really strong central performance from Jane Fonda, which brought her back from oblivion, I think. Yeah. She was so good in that. So yeah. good. Another one, I, I, I won't touch it for very long, but one of my favorites from that year, um, it's an Italian film, A Special Day, uh, with Sofia Loren and Marcello Mastroianni. Yeah. Um, and again, like after her heyday in the early 60s, doing all those great films with De Sica and some of the others and winning the Oscar for two women, she kind of got caught up in these big budget schlock films for a lot of the yes. um, that period in between. And then all of a sudden she's back as a depressed wartime wife hooking up with a homosexual priest in wartime Italy. And she's phenomenal. It's a beautiful, beautiful performance, I think. And I think he got nominated and she did not. Is that correct? That's correct. And the, I don't think there was room for her that year because wow. there's also exactly. Liza Minnelli in New York, New York, who I would have nominated. But I mean, who do you leave off, right? So. I know. I know. It was, it was an extraordinary year. And it was Diane Keaton who did win for Annie Hall, Woody Allen's love story that changed everything about the love story yep. hollywood love stories exist with three rules boy meets girl boy loses girl boy gets girl back woody allen added a fourth rule in 1977 with annie hall boy loses girl forever and he based it on his relationship his real life relationship with diane keaton and his friend said are you out of your mind this is going to show everything about you and he just looked at them and said that's what writers do and this is what made Woody Allen a, a major filmmaker. This is what took him from being a comedian with, you know, good films, love and death, bananas, everything you wanted to know about sex. This is what made him an iconic director. He won the Academy Award for Best Director. It won Best Picture over a massive, massive pop culture phenomenon. And his career has never been the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's, I know you've got a soft spot for Close Encounters, but it really is quite a phenomenal comedy for that time. Yes, yes um, it, is. it is. I just think it's, it's such a smart film. And even watching it now, yeah, certain pieces of it dated. And I think a lot of people have emulated what he did. Um, 
I'm thinking when Harry met Sally is like in terms of the style of that film. Um, but it still feels really good and she's absolutely adorable in it. Yeah, she is. She's terrific. I loved her in Good Bar that year too. That was a... That scared movie. the crap out of me. <laughs> so, <laughs> a tough movie to watch. You know, the ending is just horrifying. Yes. As, I, as you're coming of age, which I've turned around 17 then, so you're sort of kind of feeling your way with stuff and it's like is that what it's like out there i don't think i want to go so, yeah yeah it was certainly a cautionary tale sorry i had the uh, urge to just noodle that riff from the bgs on my guitar <laughs> um i can honestly play that and walk around the house for two straight hours it's a lot of fun but saturday night fever we got to talk about it. it's john travolta man he could dance the boy could dance and the boy could act. And I think through the years, he's become almost a parody of himself. There was a time John Travolta was probably more famous than God. And Saturday Night Fever pushed him over that. People forget he was nominated for Best Actor for this. And it's a really great film about angst and getting out. Getting out of where you where you're, think you're stuck. And the dance scenes are, are extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. The soundtrack went, I think, triple platinum. But the center, the heart and soul of the movie are Travolta and that, that iconic three-piece white suit, which all of a sudden guys started dressing better. You know, it had, it had an incredible impact on, on 1977. When you look back, that's a relative term. <laughs> yes, yes. Because I don't think, too, I wouldn't want to be caught dead in any of those outfits right now, but. No, nor would I. Nor, nor would I ever, I should add. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to touch on one more uh, female-centric movie from that year, uh, The sure. Turning Point. Um, yeah. It's both Anne Bancroft and Shirley MacLaine were up for Best Actress for that. And it's a film about ballet and choice. And Shirley MacLaine's the character who got married and raised a family, leaving the ballet. And Anne Bancroft stayed with it, did not have a family. And it's almost an updating of... Um, it's an old Betty Davis movie called Old Acquaintance. Um, yes, where yeah. They're both successful writers. One more serious than the other. The other one has a family. And then the rivalries that, the pent up rivalries that kind of surface as they get back together and examine each other's lives. Yeah, I remember the time loving the movie, um, particularly some of the ballet sequences which were spectacular with Mikhail Baryshnikov and I think it was yes. Leslie Brown. Yeah. Um, and Herb Ross directed, and I think his wife was quite prominent in the ballet world. So, but if you, if I've watched that movie in the last maybe four or five years, it hasn't aged particularly well. Um, no, it hasn't. It hasn't. It hasn't. About a year ago, and it's it's very dated. It doesn't feel even relevant then. Like I, I it must have felt relevant for people watching it back then. I don't know. It feels very, very. It's not sexist in, some, in a certain way almost yeah uh, both yeah, McLean yeah. and Bancroft are very good McLean I think is a little better uh, yeah. she's a little more real down to earth but it's it's one of those one big hit 11 Oscar nominations didn't win anything I don't think um no but, it, didn't. it didn't but it's, it's like you look back now it's like okay that wouldn't happen right now no no, no. the other one we should mention there's a couple more we should mention from 1977 to this day I still think that John Frankenheimer's Black Sunday is the greatest film made about international terrorism. It was based on the book by Thomas Harris, who later wrote a book called The Silence of the Lambs that became a masterpiece in the 90s. And this is about a Vietnam veteran being seduced by a terrorist group from the Middle East who decide they're going to blow up the Super Bowl. And it's such a, a realistic premise and Frankenheimer shot it with almost a documentary look and feel to it. It had such authenticity that you wonder why, why haven't they thought of this? Or, or have they? And it's been thwarted. Bruce Dern plays Michael J. Lander. And this is the performance that I think should have won the Academy Award in 1977. He's, he's terrifying. He's heartbreaking. He's poignant. And he's absolutely chilling. It's, it's just a great film on every level. It was supposed to be Paramount's big summer blockbuster. And it was in and out of theaters in two weeks. Well reviewed, just nobody went. I would be remiss if I didn't mention one more film before we move on to 1978, just because I know it holds a special place in your heart, John. Um, Exorcist II, The Heretic, go. Still, 
still, after nearly 50 years, the single worst film I've ever seen. All right, that's what I was waiting for. I just wanted uh, to go I saw it at the Regent in downtown Oshawa, and I was expecting, John Borman directed it. He directed Deliverance. I was expecting something. Richard Burton with that great rumbling voice of God, Louise Fletcher, Linda Blair, Max von Sydow, James Earl Jones, and it was absolute trite on every level. It was garbage. And I, to the, I, as I said, I've seen bad movies since. Many, many, many bad movies. Adam, Adam Sandler's worst movie doesn't <laughs> touch this. This, this is just garbage. And I've never seen it, and I don't think I will. Oh, you got to see it. <laughs> you got to see it just to sit back and go, what the hell were they thinking? <laughs> it's awful. If I could mention one other from 77, uh, Paul Newman in Slapshot. Oh, yes, of course. Which is one of the great, one of the great comedies set in the sports world. And a rare hockey film. Ho ice hockey is not a big deal in the U.S., or at least it wasn't until Gretzky got down there. But this was about a minor league hockey team. This vulgar, profane movie was written by a woman, Nancy Dowd, who would later win the Academy Award the following year for coming home. And it's hysterical. It's absolutely hysterical. I played hockey all my life, and I can tell you what goes on in these dressing rooms was, was like, why, like being in the, in the place again. It just it put me home, you know? <laughs> And they, they swear like troopers, they are horrible, they're misogynist, they're pigs. And that's what hockey players were until the TV cameras trained in on them. And Gretzky and Bobby Orr were gentlemen. Um, it's one of Newman's best performances. He did all of his own skating. Every time you see Newman on the ice, that's Paul Newman. And it co-starred Michael Onkeen, who had a, a part on television's The Rookies. And he was a pro hockey player for a while, and he's terrific in it. Really, really good film. Yeah, for our listeners uh, who might be outside of Canada, you're listening to Three Canadians. Hockey's kind of a big deal up here, so part of the reason why we love that movie. Uh, really funny, really, really great film. It's our baseball, put it that way. Exactly. Uh, John and I recently did an entire lengthy podcast discussing superhero films, and so we won't really talk about Superman the movie too much uh, here, but it was released in 1978, one of a couple of big genre films that came out. Um, John, do you want to just touch on it briefly and then we can move on? Check out our, our previous podcast on, on the YouTube channel to anyone listening on superheroes. There's a lot of discussion there. Yeah. All year, all year long through 1978, we'd seen really great commercials. For Superman, you'd be hurtling through the sky, you'd see the S crest coming at you in this deep rumbling voice, you'll believe a man can fly. And so I walked into the movie New Year's Eve, and okay, show me. And from those beautiful opening credits that kind of fizz out at you till the end of the film, I was absolutely entranced. I believe a man could fly. It's a stupid ending when he turns back time, dumbass ending. But everything about the movie, everything other than that, I absolutely love. And Christopher Reeve, I think, is, is the greatest Superman in Superman history. Sorry, Nick. Well, you know what? I wouldn't even disagree with that. I have my issues with the movie, but there's no argument against Christopher Reeve as, as the quintessential Clark Kent Superman. He was perfect. I, I wouldn't disagree with that for a second. You know what he did better than anybody that's ever played the part? I think... His real performance there, his real gift, as is, is as Clark Kent. Yes. And he makes me a doofus. And, and then it, turns into this, you know, just by straightening up his shoulders, which he does in Superman 2 and taking off the glasses, he becomes Superman. I, I thought he was great. Yeah, I, I absolutely, 100% agree. Yeah. One of my all-time favorite movies uh, was released in 1978. And I love the movie for the main reason I love it is because I know how on the edge they were filming it and how it was barely going to make it. And they never knew if it was going to happen. And they had a shoestring budget and no time to do it. And that's John Carpenter's Halloween. Um, the modern horror film sort of, there's a big tentpole in 1960 with psycho. And then 
you see this subgenre, the slasher film, which is really created in 1978. Um, actually, taking off from what the Texas Chainsaw Massacre did, but these John Carpenter and company managed to put together this really incredible movie uh, with barely anything. And the mask that's become iconic, it's one of my favorite pieces of movie trivia, is actually a William Shatner, Captain Kirk mask that they just painted white and cut the eye holes out bigger because they said it was a plain face. And when he put the mask on, it was terrifying because there was no emotion on it. And the audience just projected all their fears onto that character. You want to take this one, Alan? Um, sorry, you guys were cutting out and I didn't even hear what you were talking about. It was just okay. going, I think I'm Halloween. 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 Okay. I'm going to talk about Halloween, okay? Yes, go for it. Yeah, you're right. Halloween was a was a sensation, and they had no money. They had they had a director who'd had some success in television, and it came out of nowhere. And yes, horror films had been humanized in 1955, really, with the Night of the Hunter, and then later Psycho, more so with Psycho, and then Halloween, and it created a new subgenre of horror. And they've been, just, they've been running with it ever since. The first time I saw Halloween, it scared the hell out of me. It really did. It was terrific. Beautifully shot. Incredibly well directed. And edited. The editing is just astounding. And it was a major, major success. Yeah, Josh. I remember... I'm sorry, I'm going to jump in. I do... Halloween, we saw that. A group of us went from high school in 1978 at the Marks Theater in Oshawa. Mm -hmm. Terrified me. I thought that it was... It, scared the crap out of me throughout the yeah. whole thing. And at the end of the movie, one of the people sitting behind me put his hand very hard on my shoulder and screamed just at one of the highlight spots in that film. <laughs> I, I peeled myself off the ceiling of the Marks Theater. Oh my God. And that was all thanks to John Carpenter. Yeah, yeah. And you can't forget the music, which is so iconic. A perfect, a perfect choice for the film. And, and the music there sounds a lot like the music in The Exorcist. I do get the two of them confused sometimes. Yes, yes. Yeah, the Halloween music is is uh, much more simplistic, but they yeah. have a similar tempo and a similar tone. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I, they're often confused with each other. Both great pieces of music. Yeah. We also got The Deer Hunter in 1978, which I know you got a lot to say about, John. Well, I, I do. I do have a lot to say, and a lot of it is negative because of what came to be known about Michael Cimino and what came to be known about the film. The Deer Hunter started being shown around to the studios in August of that year, and that, that's a common practice. They show each other their wares. And I saw it in December of 1978 and was, was very impressed with the opening hour and a quarter where they, you know, they explore their lives in Pennsylvania, very authentic, very real. You understand the friendship. I had a hard time believing three guys from the same town who knew each other would end up in the same squadron in Vietnam. But, you know, stretch of imagination. And then the Russian roulette scenes were absolutely chilling. And reading about Michael Cimino in the New York Times, he said he was a Vietnam veteran. He'd served in Vietnam. He'd, he'd seen firsthand account of Russian roulette being used by the Viet Cong as torture. And you can't do that. You can't tell lies like that because the press will always find out. And they did find out. Michael Cimino had never been in the military. He'd never been out of the United States till he, till he shot the deer hunter in Thailand. Thereby, he had never seen Russian roulette used as a torture by the Viet Cong. And the Viet Cong denied it to begin with. The U.S. State Department denied it. So you have this movie that's going to win awards after award and after award, and it's predicated on lies. And there's a lot of people in Hollywood who have said publicly, had the voting for the Oscars come after all of this came out, no way The Deer Hunter wins Best Picture, no way Chimino wins Best Director. They would have given it to a film about Vietnam, but it would have been coming home. Hal Ashby's masterpiece. Alan, jump in. Jump in, my friend. Um, yeah, and The Deer Hunter, I kind of hated that movie. I saw it once. I've seen pieces of it since. For me, the part of the film is the opening scenes. I think you mentioned that, um, where you see the friendship and the life in that town. Yeah. Uh, that felt very real. And you get to see what Meryl Streep was capable of doing. Um, because it's the first movie where she had some real prominence. 
Um, but I, I just hated it. I, I, I hated watching those scenes with Russian roulette in Vietnam. Um, I just, I felt there's nothing other than De Niro yeah. and Street, there's no, and, and John Cazale, I didn't like anything about that movie. Mm -hmm. um, it just felt, it felt wrong. Um, it's and, a very uh, ugly portrait of the Viet Cong. They're, they're portrayed as sadistic animals. Yes. And they weren't. They yeah. weren't. They were a people who believed in what they were doing just as the Americans believed in what they were doing. Yeah. And that's, that's what I hated was how it was so racist. Yeah. Very racist. And I mean, coming, you mentioned Coming Home, which was one of my favorite films out here. Yeah. It just it took such a more thoughtful uh, approach to look at the war. I mean, these guys coming back damaged in just learning how to cope again, and you're seeing what the war actually did to them. Yeah, um, you don't get a sense of that in the Deer Hunter at all. It, it was no. all about the, uh, I don't know, it was all about the violence and the sensationalistic component. Um, coming home really, I think, struck the smarter chord in a more accurate one. I think so too, and it's such a melancholy, sad film. These people's lives have been torn apart by this war. And the Bruce Byrne character in particular, he was a hawk. He wanted to go to Vietnam. He believed in Vietnam. And he gets there and he's got that wonderful scene with Jane Fonda where he's just walking around in the Hong Kong hotel room in disbelief. You know, my men were chopping off heads and he just, he can't believe that they're doing it. Yeah. And he comes home and his wife has cheated on him. So his country's betrayed him. The war has betrayed him and his wife's betrayed him. And he's got that heartbreaking scene at the end where he swims into the sea and they cut it with Luke Martin, the John Voight character, talking to a group of high school students where he finally breaks down all to the tune of Tim Buckley's Once I Was. And I, I think it's one of the most beautifully edited, acted and shot scenes I've ever seen. Yeah. What I love about that movie is like all these great songs on the soundtrack and I keep going back to the music, but this, the, the music, it just helps so much in terms of your experience with the film. Yes. But there, all that music yes. was, we're hearing that for the first time in that kind of story. Everything yeah. that Ashby used on the soundtrack has become cliche now, but it wasn't when he did it for the here. Here it was the first time and it, made, it was perfect. I remember watching it in, uh, in the Oshawa Center and the opening credits come on and it's the Rolling Stones were out of touch. Yeah. And I never heard it in the movie before. And then yeah. all the songs were like that. You've never heard it in a film before. And yeah. now when you see a Vietnam film, there's, there's so many of those songs are in the Vietnam movies. Yeah. And you're right, Ashby, Ashby did it first and he did it right. And they should have gave him the Academy Award for it. Yeah, I agree. You hear there's something happening here. Like you just picture yeah. Um, over and yeah. over and over, you know. Well, and I forget the song that's playing when the uh, one of the actress's young brother shoots the air into his veins in the hospital. Um, Time. I, yeah. Oh, yeah. It just makes sense. It's a great film. It's a great film. I've watched it probably 25 times in my life, and I never get tired of it. I love showing it to people who've never seen it for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, John, I know you love Heaven Can Wait. I'm going to let Alan talk about Heaven Can Wait because I know he I loves it. <laughs> I love this. Yeah, it's it's a it's a wonderful comedy. Um, a remake of a movie called Here Comes Mr. Jordan from 1941 uh, about a guy who's killed before his time um, and is able to come back to Earth, but he has to come back in another body. Um, so uh, odd premise, of course, but it's just such a nice, feel-good movie. Um, and the it's a... The romantic comedy term gets overused sometimes, and, and but here I think it's completely apt. Warren Beatty, um, probably his best comedic performance, I think. Um, great cast, Diane Cannon, um, hysterical. God, she's good. God, she's oh. good for this. Um, her and Charles Grodin as, I think they're, once has been his business manager, the, the body that Warren comes back in as a multimillionaire um, kablon, or magnet. Um, and Diane Keaton is his wife, but she's high strung. She is, her screams and her laugh is hysterical. Um, and Julie Christie, although her and Warren had split up by this time, really nice chemistry between the two of them as the, um, the lovers. 
Um, it's just a, a really nice movie, it's a smart movie, just showing the growth of an individual and how people perceive individuals once you really don't know who they are. Once you, and when you don't know who they are and you start trying to figure out who they are. The other guy I liked in that movie a lot is Jack Warden as the coach. Um, he's really good, or, uh, the coach and the manager. Um, getting Warren, getting him to believe that, yes, I am this guy and it's a different body, but I'm back and you gotta get me back into shape again. Warden was terrific. He was, he was. Everything about that movie is terrific, I love it. And nice script, like what I like about that movie is there's so many odd lines, like where you expect the dialogue to go, it doesn't really go, um, and they yeah. find these quirky moments. And I think that's thanks to Elaine May, who helped him with the screenplay. I think yes. that's her influence there. Yes. That's great film. Great film. John, what else do you want to touch on for 78? For 78, I, I just want to briefly mention the Buddy Holly story because this one kind of came out of nowhere and it got Gary Busey an Academy Award nomination. And a few years ago, I was in Los Angeles doing interviews and I was in a restaurant and who was in there but Gary Busey. And he is such a waste of a human being now that wonderful, wonderful actor who was so good in the Buddy Holly story, so good in Lethal Weapon as the villain, is just a loudmouth, obnoxious drunk. And it was such a, such a letdown to see that publicly, you know, asking, asking all the people around him, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? And I just thought, God, what, what a waste, what a waste of a talent, because the Buddy Holly story was a really good movie. And he was terrific in it, did his own singing at a time when actors weren't really doing their own singing. Yeah. Kind of sad. Yeah. Are we good for 78 then? Alan, do so. you have anything else? Um, the only one I mentioned a little bit, Grease. I mean, well, not a great film by any stretch, but it like kind of was one of the cultural shifts or cultural icons of that year. Um, a stupid musical from the early 70s that ran for a long time. Uh -huh. And they put John Travolta and Lydia Newton John in it, made a fortune. Everybody in that cast was probably 10 years old, too old to be in high school. Um, yeah. But there was something about the music, um, the nostalgia for the 50s, and a group of people really just having a great time on screen that became addictive for everybody. I know people who went to that movie four or five times that summer. You'd sit there, watch it, and then you'd sit there and watch it again. Everybody loved that. That's what hooked me was how much how much fun they were having, you know. Yeah. And it was a fun movie. You know, the songs were singable, hummable. You could tap your toes, and it was just just good fun, goofy, good yeah. fun. Nineteen seventy nine um, saw the release of one of my favorite films ever. Um, we've talked about Hal Ashby, but being there is just a movie I never get tired of. Um, which one he wants to take off on this one? Go ahead, Al. Um, yeah, okay, I'm just getting my head around it. So it was based on a Jersey Kaczynski novel, which I had read, um, but I don't think I appreciated it until I actually saw the film. Um, so it's Peter Sellers as a mentally challenged individual cared for by a man who's passed away. And because he's now out in the world on his own, um, he doesn't, re he has no worldly experience. So from this genteel first few scenes where he's in this protected environment, now suddenly he's on the streets of Washington where it's absolute chaos, um, gets accidentally hit um, by a limousine, which is being driven by Shirley MacLaine's driver. And then all of a sudden he's in this world of politics and money and wealth where everything he says, which are very simple, un what's not unbiased statements, like he's very, he's, simple guy, um, suddenly he becomes this sage of knowledge and influencing world leaders. It's, it's a lovely story, a fairy tale story um, about innocence. Um, and I think the gullibility of people wanting to have somebody who's this sage of knowledge and not really. I, I love that we were in on the joke that yes. he was simpleton. And yeah. he's, he's speaking in gardening terms he's talking about gardening literally the president of the united states thinks that he's talking metaphors about economics i love that i thought that was hysterical and yeah. you think could could a could a simpleton really be in the white house well yeah we know they can look what's there now 
But Peter Peter Sellers was spectacular in this movie, just spectacular. Yeah, and a, and a nice supporting cast too. I, Shirley MacLaine, I, I think she's a terrific actress. What I like what she does here is she's very subdued and very feminine, and you don't usually see that with Shirley MacLaine. Very true. Uh, very true. She's very very lovely. And Melvin Douglas, who won the Oscar um, as her husband, her much older husband. Um, also really great. Like he suddenly became this great character actor. He was a leading man in the 30s and 40s, went away, did some stage work, a, a lot of stage work, I think, and then came back in the 60s. And suddenly he's this terrific character actor. Yeah, he was very good. I've got a hard time with him winning that Oscar for that, though. I do, too. I do, too. I remember at the time I was actually rooting for Mickey Rooney in the Black Stallion. So. I had a hard time with that, too. Yeah. <laughs> I absolutely love Shirley MacLaine in being there. And... Um, Peter Sellers' performance is remarkable. I very much see this film as a predecessor to Forrest Gump. In a lot of ways. Yes, yeah. in a lot of ways. So, John, uh, let's just talk about the year. We're in the last year of the decade. Uh, there's one film I really want to get to talking about, which is really Scott's Alien. But what, uh, let me see, Apocalypse Now. I mean, go. <laughs> Apocalypse Now, I think, towered over every other film release of 1979. I saw it uh, the day it opened, downtown Toronto at the University Theatre, and it was expensive. It was 10 bucks to see it. You got a beautiful program. And I came out, called my dad, said I was going to be late, and got back in line to go see it again. I couldn't believe what I had just seen. Francis Ford Coppola made a movie based on Conrad's Heart of Darkness but set it in Vietnam and made the Vietnam War the background. And from the opening frame, when this jungle bursts into flames and you can't take your eyes off it, and then we see the superimposition of a, a soldier upside down, and it's Martin Sheen waiting for his mission, which is going to be to go kill Kurtz, played by Marlon Brando. <sighs> Stunning. The, the movie's an odyssey. And the best performance in the film is on screen for, I think, 15 minutes. Robert Duvall plays Lieutenant Kilgore. And he would have been my choice for the Oscar that year. He was, he was absolutely stunning. But Martin Sheen as Willard is another gigantic performance that wasn't even nominated. And Apocalypse Now, to me, there's Apocalypse in 79, there's Apocalypse Now and all the rest. And I said in 79 when I saw it, we'll still be talking about this movie in 50 years. Well, aren't we? And Coppola should have won another directing Oscar. It should have won Best Picture. Masterpiece on every level. You want to talk a little bit about uh, how much of a dick Marlon Brando was? When he showed yeah, up? Yeah, Mar Marlon was known to misbehave. And he, he cashed the check for a million bucks he got, agreeing to do the movie. Then he shows up grossly overweight, weighing nearly 300 pounds to play a, a Green Beret soldier. Shaved his head would not learn his lines. He wanted to improvise everything. To his credit, the monologue he improvises at the end about what drove him over the edge, what turned him against the Americans, is, is stunning. It's haunting. I can't imagine another actor, another American actor, delivering that monologue with the same heartache. It's terrific. Yeah. But yeah, he was, he was an ass. If you watch the documentary, Hearts of Darkness, he'll be doing a scene and he'll look at Coppola and he said, that's all I can do today and just walk away. And Coppola is by now pouring his own money into this damn movie. And he stops takes at one point because he swallows a bug. Just, just horrible behavior, horrible behavior. And yet, look what, look what turned out. You know? That's what's so remarkable about it is that you get such genius out of him, even though yes. that's his attitude. Yes. What, what, did you, what did you think of it, Alan? I don't think you and I have ever talked about Apocalypse Now. No, I, I mean, I think it's an amazing film. I think it's probably the, it's in my top 10 of the decade. Um, um, for me, it's, it's a tough one. And at the time when I watched it, I kind of hated Brando because um, I, I think all the negative stuff I had read, and there was a lot of negative stuff out there at the time that the film opened, and it colored it for me. But I've watched it since, and it's it's pretty spectacular watch. And for me, it's it's more about Duvall and Sheen and the cinematography. Yes. Um, it, there's, it's stunning. And I think Machine, I never understood why he wasn't nominated. And I think 
Al Pacino's nomination for Injustice for All shouldn't have happened, and Sheen should have probably been there instead. I agree. And the cinematography, Vittorio Storaro shot that film, and he won an Oscar for that. He won an Oscar for Reds, and then he won an Oscar for The Last Emperor, one of the great directors of photography of all time. Yeah, very beautiful. It's a beautiful movie. Um, there was a little sci-fi horror movie that came out in 1979 from director Ridley Scott. It was based on H.R. Geiger's impressionist drawing called Necronom 4, I believe. And it showed this phallic, weird, alien-looking creature. And this... 70s were huge for a million reasons, but in the horror genre particularly... This is a monster movie, and I think it's really effective. Uh, what do you guys think? Incredibly effective. I, it's a terrific movie. It's in my top two or three scary movies of all time. I remember at the time being watching that film and having the, that sense of dread throughout that whole movie. And when that thing came out of John Hurt's stomach, I was just oh. like, oh, my God. Um, terrified throughout the whole thing but and I think more so because I, we didn't understand what it was um, and you, or how it became to be or what it was going to do to them it was just that and, and everything was so cold in that film the look of the film was very cold the steel the, like where they were and even the friggin alien itself the teeth Ugh. anyway I just remember walking out of that movie and checking the back seat of my car before I got in it because <laughs> It was just, it terrified me, it terrified me. And I think, I think it's still the best of all of them. Uh, as much as I love Aliens, the, the one from 86, I do think the first one's the best one. I like that Ridley Scott took the, the sci-fi genre and merged it with a horror film. To me, Alien is a big haunted house movie set on a space freighter. And everything about it, everything you just said is absolutely true anchored by this exceptional performance from this unknown actress, Sigourney Weaver, who mm -hmm. is terrific. I, I don't know how she wasn't nominated in 79, because other than it was a great year for ladies, but she's terrific in it. And it uh, really established Ridley Scott as a major director. Yeah. Sorry guys, just one second. Oh, uh, editing, editing, okay. So I'm going to jump in with one of the, like, John mentioned the great year for ladies. And there's a couple of performances that I want to talk about. Two female centric, actually three. I'm going to, but John jump in. So the Rose um, yeah. with Bette Midler. Um, finally, after most of the decade, Bette Midler being one of the most exciting performers on stage and on television and on record, she got a film worthy of what she was capable of doing. And it was a very, a pseudo documentary of Janice, or a film about Janis Joplin. Uh, where she's playing this character, the Rose, um, and, and she's spectacular. I don't think the movie's pretty terrific. I think there are great scenes in the movie, um, but her volcanic performance is almost overwhelming. She's so good. She's so raw. Um, I, I, it's a, it's an incredible performance for a first time out. I think. I agree. I agree. I think it's one of the greatest debuts in movie history, and she, man, she gives it everything. It's a soulful heartbreaking piece of acting yeah uh, and she never really got there again no no uh, she didn't ever no. ever she i mean she was be, she seemed to be about to with down and out in beverly hills and yeah. people but she just she never got over that hump again to be back yeah. in, in the big leagues i mean there's one coming out she's playing bella abzug in a new film yeah um, so that could be interesting not sure i hope so because um, she's good yeah. Um, the other one I wanted to touch on was uh, Sally Field and Norma Ray. Oh, God. Um, and again, that's, I think that's a great film the, about the um, need to, for the textile workers to form a union and this character being the driving force to help the New York guy who comes into town um, push that union through. And I think Sally Field, she had a lot of crap she had to do before getting to Norma Ray. Yes. This is Gidget, this was the Flying Nun, this was the girl with something extra. Uh, incredibly talented, um, but just not taken seriously um, until she got civil um, and she had to fight for that one. And then she showed what she could do. And then three years later, she gets Norma Ray. And it's, I, I think it's probably still her best performance. 
because she, again, so raw, so real, just, she is a normal person who has incredible drive and incredible smarts, but she's in a situation where she doesn't always get to show it. Yeah. Um, and her strength is just phenomenal. Um, and I know that the scene that gets parodies where she's standing up with that sign that says union, but that little person is almost titanic in how strong she is at that point. I just, I think she's terrific. And I, I don't know how, if I were voting, I don't know who I would have picked her or Midler, probably Sally Field, but both really, really good performances. It's interesting. She won every single acting award she could that year. The critics gave her everything, the Academy, the Globes, yep. everything. And I agree with you. I think it's her best work. I think it's one of the best performances ever put on film, certainly in the top 10. Yeah. And, and who would have thought? I mean, I saw her in Sybil, and I thought, yeah, she's good. The girl can act. But who'd have thought she could go to that level? Yeah. That was that was absolutely magnificent. Yeah. And the other thing I wanted to touch on was a, another Jane Fonda performance, because this is Fonda in her prime, and the China Syndrome. Um, ultimately, I think more Jack Lemmon's film than Jane Fonda's, um, but she's very good as the, the, uh, the news reporter. But, and what I remember about the China Syndrome, seeing it, really good movie came back and then like i think it was two weeks later a uh, three mile island happened and like people were criticizing the china center for saying this could never happen this you're blowing this out of proportion and then it actually happened yeah suddenly jane fonda looked like one of the smartest people on the planet um, and it in the united states which which helped even more you know yeah but again, that's what, and uh, my partner, it's one of his favorite movies. And I, I'm not sure why it is, but I think it's the idea. Um, again, you're looking at journalism and trying to expose corruption um, and people hiding behind the company line. And it, when it all comes down to it, it's like, you know what? We are so vulnerable um, and your stupid lies are going to kill us. Yeah. Great, great movie. And I think both she and Lemon deserve their nominations. They were terrific. Yeah. The big one at the Oscars that year, despite Apocalypse Now, despite all the other films we've talked about, was Kramer versus Kramer, which is a legitimately good movie, probably a great movie about a couple divorcing and the wife just splits. Meryl Streep just leaves and leaves her five-year-old son in the care of his father, played by Dustin Hoffman. And I'm a big Dustin Hoffman fan. I'm a believer in this guy. I think his best work was Tootsie. But he won the Academy Award for this, and it's, it's a brilliant performance. But the courtroom scenes with he and Streep together are where the, the real meat of the movie is. And they are profoundly moving and interesting that, that the court always sides with the women. Motherhood, right down the line. Even though we've watched the, the evolution of the friendship between father and son become something really beautiful. And critics went crazy for it. Audiences did too. It was a big hit. Five Academy Awards. I just, I just don't believe Best Picture and Director should have been among them. No, I'm on near side on that one. And if it wasn't going to be Apocalypse Now, for me, it would have been um, either All That Jazz or Manhattan. Those are my two other favorites that year. I love All That Jazz. Such a great movie. Mm -hmm. Guts, pure guts from Bob Fosse to make a movie based on his life. You know, it was just absolute courage. Yeah, and one more movie I'm going to touch on because I think we're almost winding down um, is Ten, um, and I like that movie a lot. It, it's, I think it's one of the smartest and funniest movies uh, around male menopause, if there is such a thing, um, about guys aging and still wanting to be bad but not not really being able to be bad in the right way anymore. Um, I just I like it because you see Dudley Moore's character. He's He's got this great gig at home. He's got Julie Andrews at home as his girlfriend. He's got a lovely house, great career, but he's, he goes and he follows Bo Derek and screws everything up in the process. Um, it's, I, I think it's a really smart look at the male psyche or the straight male psyche anyway, um, as it existed in the seventies. And Dudley Moore is actually, I, he's, a, he's a nice actor in the right role. And I think he was well partnered with Julie Andrews in this one, who is the voice of Sanity. I think so too, and I, I think it's one of Blake Edwards' best films. So um, I, yeah. Bo Derek became a poster girl with this movie, and uh, you know every every young guy in America was lusting after her. Well, I remember at the time watching it. Um, there's a scene, and I didn't realize I just read Julie Andrews' book when she was costumed by Blake Edwards' ex-wife. 
Um, oh, which, really? she <laughs> yeah, she, which she wasn't keen on um, because she was now Blake Edwards' current husband. But she said what she did for her in that movie was actually make her feel more contemporary, more stylish. And there's a scene where she comes flying out of the house. She's wearing leather pants and she's got this jacket on, but she's not wearing a blouse. It just flies open for a second. You don't see anything. And suddenly it's like, oh, Julie Andrews is really a woman. Like it suddenly she became contemporary. Yes. And yeah. Sexy, you know. Anything else we want to touch on, guys? We're approaching the oh. end of the decade. I'll briefly talk about Hair, Milos Forman's adaptation of the, the great 60s musical. Everybody told them not to do it. The studio wanted to do it. They'd wanted to for years. They rewrote the, the text of the play and came up with a movie that absolutely plunged you back into the age of Aquarius. 30 seconds into the movie, well, two minutes into the movie, you're back in the 60s and it feels good to be there. There's a real sense of freedom, of peace, of happiness. And yet there's this percolation of the Vietnam War going on. And the songs from Hare are spectacular when they're used properly. And Foreman does everything right with this movie. The choreography by Twyla Tharp was revolutionary at the time because it suggested freedom and happiness and peace and sex and love. And a time capsule for the 60s made 10 years later, made in 1979. One of the great movie musicals of all time, I think. I, I agree. And it took me a while to get there with that one. I felt they were a little, even though it was 1979, only 10 years after it was supposed to be happening, it felt a little odd. But after watching it, and I've watched it multiple times since, it's it's absolutely perfect. And I've seen a couple of productions on stage. And wow. one, I think it was revived like 2009, an amazing, spectacular production of it. But it doesn't touch the movie. No. Uh, the movie makes you understand it. Um, I don't know. It, it's terrific. And the play to me feels like a bunch of vignettes with songs. Yeah. It does, yeah. And the film was a, was a narrative, had a story, and a yeah, story that I was into, you know? Yeah, I, I've seen three productions on the stage. The one in 2009 came the closest. Um, yeah. It felt more immediate, but the other two I saw were like, okay, take me home. Uh, yeah, let's absolutely. Watch the movie. Let's watch the movie. So. Yeah, and a great movie it is. And Diane Keaton's in the original cast recording. Yes, she is. Yes, yes she is. Thinking about black boys. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it, folks. Our 1970s spotlight. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to check us out at www.footandfriendsonfilm.com. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and most importantly, be sure to check out our official YouTube channel. Click like, share, and subscribe for this, all past and future podcasts. Got a lot of cool stuff coming up. We're going to be focusing on other decades, including the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, 2010s, all that plus lots more. I'm your host, Nick Mailer. Until next time, see you at the movies.